If I could have your attention, um, if you could find a place to sit, we'll get started momentarily. We'll give you a couple minutes. Hey, Jess. Before we get officially started, um, I do believe that most in this room have been vaccinated. Uh, we have left to you the choice of wearing a mask, uh, being adults. Um, we'll let you be the decider of that. Uh, but I will also say that Scott informed me that last year during the COVID, he uh, and his partner invested in a bipolar ionization system that really um, I could not do justice to it, but it certainly does cleanse the air, um, purifies the air, replaces the air here periodically with that outside. So if there's a system that really uh, goes far in satisfying this issue, I'm sure you're going to find it right here. So Scott, a wise investment. Uh, let me begin by welcoming everyone, both, are we all set up back? Okay. Let me begin by saying good morning. My name is Dana Connors, and it's my pleasure on behalf of the Maine State Chamber of Commerce to welcome everyone uh, to today's event. I say everyone, both here in the room, but as you probably are aware from publicity we sent out in advance, there's also a remote connection. So for those who may be watching us from home or from the office, wherever it might be, we welcome you as well. Um, we also want you to know that we um, have a full day planned for you, focusing on the work of the Maine Climate Action Plan, also known as Maine Won't Work. With more frequent and intense storms, uh, with extreme doubt, a drought, with heat waves and rising sea levels, I think we all have come to know that climate change is no longer theoretical. Climate change is real. And while we see it as a global issue, one of national concern, we also know that we share the challenges right here in our state as well. But the difference is Maine has turned into a global leader with our efforts to fight climate change. Thanks to the work of Governor Mills, Hannah Pingree, and the entire Maine Climate Council. Together, they have developed the Maine Won't Wait Climate Action Plan, a plan that has assembled individuals from all over the state, from all different types of industries to unite to fight this urgent crisis. As we continue to fight climate change, Maine's businesses stand ready to seize the opportunity and build expertise to adapt to the 21st century renewable energy economy. We also stand ready to help the state reach the goals that have been set forward in the Climate Action Plan. One of the things that you will learn today is leaders from all over Maine have come together and agree that we must take action to fight climate change. I hope you will listen carefully to what all of our speakers and panelists have to say and leave with more in-depth knowledge of the Maine Climate Plan and how businesses are adapting. There is broad agreement that Maine can't wait and Maine won't wait. To tell you more about today's event, it is my honor to introduce our newest member of the Maine State Chamber of Commerce's team, Ben Lucas. Who or <laughs> ben. 
Ben organized this event today, and I want to thank Ben for his efforts and hope you all will join me, as you just did, in welcoming him to the Chamber team. Ben comes to us after most recently being the Executive Director of the Maine Jobs Council, and before that, working for Senator Susan Collins and her 2020 election. Please welcome Ben Lucas. Ben? Well, thank you, Dana. Uh, it's great to be here today. Uh, first, let me say what an honor and privilege it is uh, to be the newest member of the Maine State Chamber of Commerce. Uh, and it's even more exciting. This is my first event that I was able to plan uh, as a member of the chamber staff. So um, before we get into today's event, I just wanted to give my thanks to a couple different groups of people. Uh, first, as Dana mentioned, uh, everyone who has joined us here in person today. Uh, this was an event that was originally scheduled to be in May of 2020, uh, but due to the pandemic, it has been delayed. So it's uh, great to be here today with all of you. I also want to give thanks to everyone who's uh, joining us virtually, uh, even as we move forward and try to put this pandemic behind us, and it's great to get back to in-person events. We still have to make some accommodations. Uh, we have a great group of folks who are joining us uh, online today. Uh, next, I want to give a special thanks to all of our panelists who are joining us today. Uh, we have assembled a great group of 15 panelists and presenters and speakers. Um, They've taken time out of their incredibly busy schedules. Uh, they come from folks who are working within state government to help reach the goals of the Climate Action Plan, and also folks from the business community who are taking a really innovative, uh, leading approach on hitting the goals that have come out of the uh, Climate Action Plan. Um, I also want to thank our sponsors for today's event. Our principal sponsor is Bernstein Schur. Our streaming sponsor is the Sheridan Corporation. Our panel sponsors of Brookfield Renewable, Irving Woodlands, and Hydro-Quebec. Our break sponsors of Central Maine Power and Enbridge. And our supporting sponsors of, who are Summit Natural Gas and Unitel Natural Gas. Uh, the Maine State Chamber of Commerce thanks everyone, uh, all the sponsors, for the support of this event. Without them, this would simply not be possible. Uh, in today's summit, we are going to be highlighting, uh, after Hannah, who is lucky enough to join us today, uh, will give us a great overview of the entire Climate Action Plan. We'll be highlighting the work of four of the specific working groups of the Climate Council, the Energy Working Group, the Transportation Working Group, the Building, Housing, and Infrastructure Working Group, and the Natural and Working Lands Working Group. Uh, we are going to have time for questions and answers, and one housekeeping item I wanted to mention. Uh, there will be a microphone that is circulating for the questions. Uh, now, you may think, since it's a small room and we can all hear each other, we don't need a microphone. Uh, but it's important for the folks who are watching the live stream that they be able to hear the questions as well, and the microphone will uh, relay it uh, to them. So uh, I'll now turn it over to Stacy Fitz, who is the chair of the Maine Chamber of Commerce, Energy, and Environmental Policy Committee, uh, to introduce a special message from Governor Mills and introduce Hannah Pingree. Stacy. Thanks, Ben. And what an incredible job to pull this off and, and organize this event at a time when obviously doing anything where there's a gathering becomes a struggle. So congratulations on that and, and welcome to the chamber. Uh, so I work for Summit, or, uh, yeah, I used to work for Summit. I, I work for Onward Energy. <laughs> Onward Energy owns three of the wind farms here in Maine. Uh, Oakfield, Hancock, and Bingham. And together, you know, those are close to 300 megawatts of renewable energy. They're about five years old. So in today's world, those are now legacy projects. Uh, it doesn't take very long to be the old news. And the new news, of course, is all of the solar efforts that are ongoing and, and are the flavor of the month, but at the same time have a very or have the potential to have a very positive impact on our climate, which, I mean, today we're looking at record-breaking temperatures, which, you know, climate change can feel good now and then, but at the same time, you know, we all know that the world is a different place. When you wander the woods, you enjoy the outdoors, you see the changes that have taken place over the last just few years, and uh, we all have the responsibility to really make a positive impact and leave this place a better 
than we found it. And uh, you know, my, my history in the time in the legislature and working with the Honorable Hannah Pingree as speaker, you know, we laid the groundwork for some of the things that are happening today. This is not an overnight deal. Making these changes is hard and it takes persistence and it takes administrations that are willing to keep pushing forward when it might not feel easy to do. Uh, so this administration has demonstrated that they can pick up that ball and run with it. We're seeing remarkable change at all levels and uh, I congratulate Hannah and the governor for, for the very strong and, and remarkable changes that we're seeing. Uh, we're not done yet. We have a lot of work to do. Uh, so it's my pleasure to be able to introduce a video that the governor has, has put together for us. And at the same, after that, Hannah uh, will be taking the microphone and has a few remarks and then will be available for questions. So with that, video from the governor. Thank you. Hello, this is Governor Janet Mills. Thank you, Dana Connors and the Maine Chamber of Commerce for hosting this conference on the constructive role that Maine businesses can play in tackling the threat of climate change, a threat that international scientists now call code red for humanity. The business community, of course, plays a pivotal role in our efforts to protect this precious place we call home. With your help, we are attracting talent and technology to Maine with new energy storage, tidal, solar, and wind companies investing in this state every day. We're installing heat pumps at a record pace, reducing heating bills for hardworking Maine people, businesses, and families. And we're supporting new renewable energy projects, which are creating construction jobs and new green collar jobs across the state. In the coming years, in partnership with the Maine business community, we will more than double Maine's clean energy and energy efficiency jobs to 30,000 by the year 2030. We will double the pace of home weatherization. We will build more electric vehicle charging stations all across Maine. And we will expand public transportation options to reduce travel. We'll purchase more renewable energy through the state procurement process. And we'll ensure that state buildings and transportation systems lead by example. Through the Maine Jobs and Recovery Plan, my administration will also invest more than $300 million in housing, innovation, training, workforce training, and connectivity, and changes that will help us fight climate change. The threat of climate change is growing, but Maine is not waiting to act. So thank you for your leadership and proving what we all know to be true that acting on climate change is not only the right thing to do, it's good for business, and it's good for your bottom line, and it's good for everyone in Maine. As always, you have a committed partner in me and my administration, and I wish you a very productive climate conference. Very quiet crowd this morning. Good morning. Well, it's good to see uh, many familiar faces. Um, I am, I've got the task of running through the whole climate plan in about 20 minutes. So I'm gonna go through a few slides, but I wanna thank Dana and Ben for convening this conference. I wanna thank all of you who showed up early on a morning after a long weekend. Great to see my friend Stacy, uh, former legislator. He's got the pandemic beard getting longer by the day. Um, and uh, I also want to thank uh, many members uh, in this room who also participated in the Climate Council process. You'll hear from Tom Abello and Hannah Carter. I see Jesse Perkins right in the front row is one of our, um, our members of the Maine Climate Council representing business. So it's great to have her here. So any hard questions you can ask Jesse later in the day. Um, so I'm going to go through um, the plan. We'll see if this uh, works. Clicker, ready to go? Oh, there we go. I'm going the wrong direction. Too fast. Here we go. 
So I think uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the science. I don't think anybody in this room uh, needs to be convinced. Hopefully you're, you're here today and you understand uh, the, the rapidly increasing impacts of climate. Um, obviously, the summer IPCC report coming out of you know, a vast uh, agreement among international scientists um, that climate change is accelerating. It is here, and our time to take action um, is, is rapidly decreasing. The next 10 years is a crucial period. Obviously, international leaders are gathering uh, this fall. Uh, Governor Mills is actually going to head to Scotland and Glasgow to the UN um, COP, where people are trying to decide how do we accelerate action on climate. I keep pressing the wrong button here. Green button, oh, the big button, sorry about that. Here we go, we're going the right direction. So obviously, uh, Maine's climate plan is geared around the international effort to try to reduce emissions so that we can attempt to keep uh, global warming to 1.5 centigrades. Obviously, international scientists feel that may be increasingly out of reach, but obviously the catastrophic impact of reduce emission, of increased emissions is, is now what everyone is setting their sights on. So I don't need to also tell you about the summer that we had. Uh, we, we know that increasing um, climate change is causing uh, drought events, uh, increased heat waves. We saw heat waves across the United States this past summer, uh, wildfires. Obviously, Maine has been able to avoid some of the worst impacts, but we know that climate, um, climate change is here and its very worst impacts are beginning. So Maine, I will say I, I'm proud of the fact that Maine um, has really taken, as Stacy said, um, uh, this issue seriously, and I'm, I'm also proud that it has taken it seriously in a bipartisan way. So when Governor Mills took office in 2019, we passed LD 1679, an act to create the Maine Climate Council to specifically set emission reduction limits in law. Um, the bill was sponsored by Senator David Woodsum. Republican state senator from York County, um, and I think it was passed by an overwhelmingly bipartisan margin, which shows that people on both sides of the aisle recognize that climate is real and taking action is important. So Maine's climate action law requires that we reduce emissions by at least 45% by 2030 and 80% by 2050. Um, the governor signed an executive order that Maine should be carbon neutral by 2045. And the law also required that Maine produce a climate action plan by December 1, 2020, and a new plan every four years. Um, in addition to reducing emissions, uh, climate action is also about preparing our state, our communities, our economy, our people for the impacts of climate that are here and that are coming. So where do Maine's emissions come from? Um, we are actually somewhat unique in that we are a small rural state where people drive a lot. So 54% of our state's emissions come from transportation. Uh, nearly 30% come from our buildings, 19% from our homes, 11% from our commercial buildings, 9% uh, from industry, relatively small amount, and Maine has only 7% of our emissions come from our electricity. So Maine and the region have taken pretty strong efforts through the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative. We have a fairly uh, clean electricity grid, obviously getting cleaner by the day. Um, but our emissions, as you can see, transportation uh, and our buildings are the big nut that we need to crack. So the Maine Climate Council is a group of uh, more than 200 people who spent, we actually kicked off in September of 2019 in this very room um, with you know, many more people packed in. It was pre-COVID. Um, and we have a Climate Council of nearly 40 members representing political leaders, business leaders, uh, youth, tribal members, um, municipal members, people sort of across society, and then six different working groups, as well as a science and technical subcommittee and now an equity subcommittee. That group sort of started with the basis of we wanted to be fact-driven, we wanted to look at science. Um, so the Science and Technical Subcommittee presented a huge volume of science. You can find it at our website, climatecouncil.maine.gov, about the impacts of climate on Maine and what we expect to see in the future. Um, we did significant cost-benefit analysis and greenhouse gas modeling. We did an equity assessment with the help of University of Maine. We also produced a specific report on how can Maine's climate action produce good-paying jobs in the transition to a lower uh, carbon economy. 
So the Maine Climate Count, um, Action Plan has four main goals. One, to reduce our emissions to meet the law. Two, to make Maine more resilient to the impacts of climate change. Three, to foster economic opportunity and prosperity as we take action. And lastly, to advance equity through Maine's um, climate response. So the, the eight strategies of the climate plan came out of uh, months and months of work that went online painfully. Um, but we, we were incredibly proud that uh, hundreds of recommendations were able to be boiled down to these eight strategies, and they really are the important ones. The first three are about reducing our emissions in transportation, in our buildings, in our electricity sector. Uh, the next strategy is about protecting and creating jobs as we uh, make this transition. Uh, the next three are about how we protect our natural lands, our communities, as well as increase our abilities to sequester carbon. And lastly, how do we engage main people, businesses, young people in this kind of climate action that we know is so important? So first, uh, transportation. It's the, it's the most important, um, and there are a variety of strategies uh, to get us there. Um, you've probably heard a lot about it over the last couple weeks, lots of discussion about electric vehicles, but uh, the transition to electrified vehicles as well as plug-in hybrids <clears throat> is really an important part of Maine's strategy. Uh, Maine's climate plan calls for over 200,000 electric vehicles on the road by 2030. Obviously, a huge undertaking and, and a lot of work to make sure we have the infrastructure to get there. How to increase, increase fuel efficiency and alternative fuels, especially for our medium and heavy duty um, vehicles. And lastly, reducing vehicle miles traveled. Maine people drive a lot um, to get to work, to get to their kids, to pick them up at school, through tourism. So both public and shared transportation options, increased high-speed internet access, as well as land use policies. As we see our state grow, we need to make sure that people are not traveling a longer and longer distance to get to work. So next, buildings. Uh, the governor mentioned heat pumps, um, but the transition to cleaner heating and cooling systems and efficient appliances um, can make a big, big difference. Maine leads the country in the deployment of high efficient heat pumps. We're seeing these systems go into schools and public buildings. We know they can save uh, people money. Uh, they can make their homes cleaner. Uh, we have hundreds of small businesses deploying these systems, um, and we are, uh, we are on track. We installed over 28,000 last year, um, again, leading the country in heat pump deployment in an incredibly cold state. We need, obviously, to make Maine's very old building stock uh, more efficient, um, including weatherization. Um, we need to make sure the new buildings we build are as efficient as possible. Um, we want to innovate and promote climate-friendly building products, and you'll hear more about that, I'm sure, in the next panel, but we think that Maine's forest product sector is really well positioned um, to help lead a, a national t trend towards things like CLT, mass timber, wood fiber insulation. Um, and last but not least, we want to lead by example in public buildings, in municipal buildings, as well as the buildings of uh, our business sector in, in the state of Maine. So reducing carbon emission through Maine's energy and industrial sectors through clean energy innovation, obviously a lot of that about, is about the transition uh, to a much cleaner grid. So Maine, as many of you probably know, has a, um, among the most aggressive renewable portfolio standards in the country with a goal of uh, a requirement that 80% of our electricity come from renewable energy by 2030 and a goal of 100% by 2050. So as part of this transition to a much cleaner grid, we know we are going to create thousands of jobs. Um, we know also that the efficiency work that needs to happen to make our homes more efficient, to install these heat pumps, will also create and require many new jobs. And we also know that we have jobs that we need to protect as the climate makes them more vulnerable, whether it's our agriculture industry, um, our forest products industry, um, our seafood sector, lots of jobs at risk and needing to diversify and transition. So the governor set a goal, as you heard her say, to create, um, to double the number of um, clean energy jobs by 2030. We're currently at about 14,000, and we want to be at 30,000 by 2030. So these jobs are in renewable energy deployment. The majority are actually at this point in the energy efficiency sector. These are people doing HVAC work. These are jobs that require skills, um, but jobs that we need thousands of workers, even to this day, to get the job done. 
So we also know that the clean energy sector is the fastest growing sector in the country of job growth. Um, they pay on average above um, average salaries, so we know these are good jobs for Maine. Um, and Maine has actually lagged the region, the New England region, over the last five years in clean energy job growth. But we know that in the coming years, we are already seeing um, growth. So protecting our natural lands, obviously we are a incredibly forested state. We are 90% forested or nearly 90% forested among the most in the country. Um, we know that these forests are sequestering carbon. Um, we know that they have huge opportunity for climate friendly job creation. And we also know the same goes for our agricultural lands and a growing area of ocean blue carbon. So uh, ways to sequester carbon in our ocean and in our near ocean lands. So Maine, as an incredibly coastal state, but obviously a natural resource-driven state, we have a lot of work to do to protect our communities um, from the impacts of sea level rise, increasing storm events, drought events, so a huge amount of effort around preparing our communities. We also know as we prepare our communities that infrastructure is very vulnerable. Um, this is just one DOT picture among many of, of a roadway uh, facing an increased storm event. Obviously, we saw late this summer just the huge impacts of, of uh, high rain events and what they did to the New York and New Jersey region. Uh, this is a road washed out in Gouldsboro just from this past spring. We saw the carriage trails at MDI washed out. So preparing for these kinds of events with increased infrastructure investments, um, more culverts, um, lots of unsexy but important things and things that create good paying jobs along the way. So tons of work to do to make our infrastructure uh, more ready for climate, um, increased climate uh, changes. So last but not least, um, engaging with Maine people and communities about climate impacts and programs. Uh, climate is scary uh, for people, but we also know that the transition uh, to a lower carbon economy to prepare for climate change is important in Maine. It can create good paying jobs. It can make your house warmer. It can um, create new opportunities for kids to stay in Maine. It can protect our natural lands. So we see lots of opportunity. It's not all doom and gloom, especially for a state like Maine. So a major focus about how we communicate. Um, I will also just say the governor mentioned uh, the importance of the business community. We certainly see the large businesses, the small businesses in Maine, the nonprofit leaders as an incredibly important part of our climate action. And you'll hear more about that hopefully. Uh, we'll be continuing to work with Dana and others on, on how do we really partner with business um, on, on climate leadership. So lots here, I won't sort of summarize this whole slide, but we see incredible opportunity for um, Maine's economy and jobs um, in the climate transition, both supporting our natural resource industries um, with the transition to energy independence, rather than buying over $4 billion of fossil fuels from out of state every year, um, making that energy in Maine is positive for our economy. Um, we see tons of innovation happening already and being accelerated, everything from offshore wind to advanced wind products, uh, advanced wood products. Um, and then again, infrastructure resilience is just a major economic uh, focus of tons and tons of uh, construction jobs as we seek to rebuild our state and build it back better for the future. And last but not least, I know that everybody in this room, including uh, the governor who, who mentioned it, um, is focused on workforce and the need to focus on the workforce to do this work, to attract it to Maine, to get our young people interested in the jobs and train for the jobs that we know we need um, is, a, is a major, major focus. So implementing the plan, we are already almost one year into it. Um, I will say the opportunity of the American Rescue Plan Act and the funding it is sending to Maine has been helpful. Um, we have seen support from the legislature, again, bipartisan support for many of the policies that are required to make Cl Maine's Climate Action Plan a reality. And we're obviously seeing huge debate right now in Washington with both the infrastructure bill and the, the new bill, um, Build Back Better bill that would, would really focus and, and support many of the priorities of Maine's Climate Action Plan. 
But I will just say, you know, politics aside, uh, we see partnerships with consumers, with businesses and communities around planning and leadership and action as really the way the work gets done. Uh, government creates incentives, it creates policy, um, but the work is done uh, by the 1.3 million people in Maine who all have the opportunity um, to be a part of this and to take action. So I will uh, leave it. I'm happy to answer a couple of questions, but that is kind of the big overview of Maine's climate plan. Um, again, we are very grateful for the support of uh, many business leaders, many community leaders as we created this plan. Again, it is just the beginning of Maine's focus on taking action. I will say there's a lot of heavy lifting to go in the years to come. Uh, 2030 seemed like a long ways away, but uh, nine years will go by quickly. So um, we are getting to work and we look forward to doing it with all of you. So again, happy to answer a couple questions. Is this a plant right here, Jim? No plant. Is this working? Yep. Okay, great. Um, Hannah, thank you so much uh, for joining us this morning. My name is Jim Cohen. I'm with, with Verrill, and uh, I've followed closely the, uh, the work of the Climate Council. This may be a question that's kind of in the weeds, and if so, maybe there are others later today who can answer the question. But I was interested that the electricity sector only comprised 7% of the overall greenhouse emissions, and we have goals about climate reductions in that sector. I guess my question is, we're doing a lot of work in Maine in the solar sector, in the wind sector, which is great. But when we turn on our light switch, the electricity comes somewhat from Maine, but also from a regional power pool. When we talk about meeting our climate goals, are we only looking at the electricity that's produced in Maine, or are we looking at Maine's share of that regional uh, set of emissions? Good question, Jim. You probably know the answer better than I do. Um, but I will say <laughs> Maine is clearly part of a regional um, energy grid, the ISO grid, and actually we work closely with our neighbors in the region who share many of the same goals. It is helpful that we're in a region that has very similar climate action planning. Um, obviously, there's lots of debate happening right now, even in the state of Maine, about our role in supporting clean energy transitions for the region. Um, I will say that uh, Maine's emissions, the way our Department of Environmental Protection counts emissions that come out of Maine, it comes sort of out of our footprint. So the people who are burning gas when they're Maine, in Maine, whether they're tourists, the fossil fuels that are burned for whatever, the energy grid comes out of our state, so we don't really have to take credit for what happens outside of our borders, but obviously climate action does not care about it. Climate change, obviously, is what we all do. Um, I will say, um, so we do have a fairly clean grid in our region, but we still have a long ways to go to get it to be 100%. And I will also say a lot of the transitions we talked about, heat pumps, electrification of vehicles, will require a doubling or tripling of our electric capacity. So many of our clean energy goals are about where we are today, but also this rapid acceleration towards a more electrified economy. So as we you know, do all these things in an electric way, we need our grid to, to be cleaner. But your point is well taken that the, what the whole region does does matter a lot because we are clearly not all alone in, in many of these challenges. Marty. Thank you. Uh, so um, I'm aware that there's a backup at the electric vehicle chargers. Uh, Mark Winter from Senator Collins' office and I got here first and grabbed them. So I think Mark. I did notice that. I drove one too, and I'm not going to be charging. <laughs> so do we think Mark should move his car? Yeah, <laughs> Mark. Anyway, I it was a chance to highlight the uh, transportation emissions, and uh, I will move my car. <laughs> and I will just note, uh, hopefully you all know Marty, who's the head of E2 Tech and actually working on Maine's Clean Transportation Roadmap, which is currently underway. So all of the work of this plan, we sort of have goals, we have a plan, we're starting to take action, but it requires a lot more thoughtful, careful work to actually plan for how it will be accomplished. So we appreciate both Marty driving an electric car and um, helping us with, with outreach on that plan. 
Hannah, so this is a Mark winner from Senator Collins' office and just called out by Marty. I will go move my car once it is fully charged. Um, but actually, that's a great segue into my question with electric vehicles. Um, that, the, I'm curious what the plan is for the electric, electrification of vehicles basically north of Augusta. Because, you know, if you're down in south of Augusta, Cumberland County, Sagadahawk, your work, it's not a problem because everything is so close and you can generally get by with a day's charging even if you charge at home or go to one of the charging stations. But A, I know, I know there's a plan for this, but A, there are no charging, fast charging stations basically north of Augusta. And, 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 and B, folks up there often have to drive 75 to 100 miles one way to go to the grocery store or whatever. So I'm just very concerned that, that northern Maine, and I'm not, I'm not saying just because you're north of Augusta is northern Maine, but anything north of Augusta, how are they going to not be left behind in this? Yeah, no, great question, Mark. And I will say uh, you'll hear from Joyce Taylor and actually Michael Stoddard at some point today um, who are both working aggressively on that. There's sort of maps of Maine right now that show, all right, we need fast charging in Washington County, in Rusick County, in sort of Penobscot County. So I think it absolutely is coming and hopefully coming soon. Um, I will say as an electric vehicle driver for the last year myself, it's very, very important we have fast charging and that's not something most businesses can install. It really requires uh, pretty significant infrastructure to make that work, and we do need it everywhere. Um, if we want people to drive electric vehicles, people of all kinds, there needs to be some comfort that as I'm driving to northern Maine or driving to Vermont that I can find a place to charge and I'm not going to be stuck on the side of the White Mountains waiting for a tow truck. So um, I, I absolutely um, will say it's a priority investment. There is funding in the American Rescue Plan to do that. There's certainly a lot of funds, as you know, at the federal level being discussed that could come to states. Uh, Maine has a, uh, specifically put our VW settlement funds as well as some of our funds that have come in through the Hydro-Quebec um, corridor project into increasing incentives for electric vehicles and charging stations, so we will keep doing that work, but as more and more people buy these vehicles, there aren't enough available right now, but they will be coming online in, in larger numbers in the next couple of years. We absolutely need to get charging right because a, a main person, again, driving in a rural area, most people will be okay charging at home, but as soon as you go more than 250 miles, you want to know that that charging station is going to be there and it's going to work when you get there. So it's a point well taken and definitely an area of focus. I think this will be our final question. Great. Thanks. Hi, Kim Mendel, Mondonado. I'm looking at your strategy H, and I have three uh, kind of points on that. One is it seems that I'm, I'm presuming that you're going to be not just engaging with, uh, you know, concerned uh, citizens, but also local small businesses. And I'm wondering if there are maybe key action steps or uh, recommendations that municipalities uh, are going to be encouraged to advocate and lastly what can we expect to see in our small main communities thank you yeah great great question I didn't set up Kim even though she has a history on North Haven um, <clears throat> so obviously I think it's first of all not certainly getting beyond the believers the believers sort of get it and they want to know what they can do but everybody else sort of what are we supposed to be doing what's supposed to be happening in our town for a busy small business owner, it's even uh, more work. So we're trying to first kind of start out with the easy steps, the win-wins, you know, everything from LED lights to heat pumps can save, you know, money at your town hall, electric charging in your town office or publicly is gonna become increasingly something your citizens ask for. Uh, vulnerability mapping, really understanding what are increasing storm events, flood events gonna mean for your town, what does it mean for public safety? I think people are more aware of that, again, after a pretty tumultuous summer um, on that, watching other parts of the country. So we are going to be launching a program at the end of this year that specifically partners with towns and helps them do planning and then does specific grants to help them take action, um, sort of starting, again, with easy stuff. We're not 
it's not the stick, it's not telling you what to do yet, but telling um, communities that if they have a plan, we will help pay for things where they can take more action. And again, programs at Efficiency Maine, at DOT, will increasingly partner with those activities. Um, I think the same thing is true for small businesses. It's about sort of the win-win, the things that they do because they want to do it, the things that they do because it could save them you know, energy costs, the things that they do because their consumers are going to increasingly ask for it. So I think we're trying to make it easy, um, kind of the common sense, like a lot of these things are going to be good for your business and good for your town. And I will say, you know, we saw a climate planning committee launch in Dover Foxcroft. We've seen, you know, Bangor and Orono are now taking action. Um, lots of coastal and inland towns across Maine are trying to figure out what to do, so the state is looking to partner with them to kind of both handhold and help fund and incentivize action. So lots more if you live in a town or run a small business or a big business. Um, hopefully you'll look into some of our public work that we'll be launching this fall and Cam, sign up all your small businesses. Thanks. Thank you, Dana. Now you know why we are so optimistic and why we consider Maine to be a global leader in the climate action, with this climate action plan. A lot of the credit uh, has to do with all people coming together in support of this, having a plan that sets a path forward, but also because of the person that you just heard from. Hannah Pingree, you have been critical to what we have just been witness to and the success that we expect to enjoy. Thank you very much. All right, so we're now gonna move into our first panel of the day, which is gonna be focusing on the natural and working lands working group. So I welcome uh, those panelists to come up and join us. Well, we'll start, we'll allow the, uh, the panelists to introduce themselves, maybe give a quick background on uh, who they work for or in their history, and uh, then we can turn it over. So, Pat, I'll start with you. Are we working? My train. Hello, hello. Oh, yeah, okay. There we go. Uh, I'm Patrick Strauch. I'm the executive director of the Maine Forest Products Council. We represent about 350 companies ranging from loggers and truckers to uh, paper mills and biomass energy plants and sawmills. And we have about uh, eight and a half million acres of dues paying members. So we're an organization that's been around over 60 years focused on those big picture things that relate to uh, the forest and the forest industry. Good morning, everybody. I'm Hannah Carter. I'm Dean of the University of Maine Cooperative Extension. Cooperative Extension fulfills part of the University of Maine's outreach mission. We've been around for a little over 100 years in all corners and communities uh, serving this state. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Tom Mabello. I'm the governor's legislative director and also her senior policy advisor for natural resources. Um, prior to this position, I served, I worked for about 19 years with the Nature Conservancy. Great, thank you everyone. So how this panel is gonna work is we're gonna give each one of these panelists about 10 to 15 minutes to kind of give their high level overview of their work in the Natural and Working Lands Working Group and the uh, Climate Council as a whole, and then we can shift to a, a Q&A portion uh, before moving on to the next panel. So Tom, would you like to kick us off? Sure. Um, what I thought I'd do is talk a little bit about progress to date on strategy E. That's on page 76 of the report, um, if you want to follow along uh, with some of the detail. But it's been almost a year since uh, the plan, as Hannah said, the plan was uh, presented to the governor. And we, I think we've made a lot of um, really strong progress on many of these initiatives so far. Uh, let me start with number one, which was around uh, protecting natural and working lands. I think um, the big... Um, step here, and this is a credit to uh, the governor's part two budget, but also um, legislative um, 
support legislative leaders like um, Senator Kathy Breen and Representative Patrick Corey uh, with uh, $40 million in her budget for the Land for Maine's Future program. Uh, this was the first new funding for that program in more than a decade and the largest um, uh, shot of funding for the program since uh, 1999. So that 40 million will come in, in over the course of four or so years, so somewhere around $10 million per year. Uh, just late last week, um, uh, the LMF board issued a call for proposals, and so that really kind of kicks off the process, and we expect a lot of really, really strong projects to come forward. Um, if you look across the state, uh, Maine has about uh, two and a half million acres uh, under conservation. Um, that's about, well, that's just around 20%, just a, a tick over 20%. Most of that is working forest conservation easements in the North Woods, uh, which is really important. It guarantees uh, sustainable forestry, uh, protects wildlife habitat, guarantees public access, but sort of ex extinguishes the possibility for development. So that's a, you know, kind of an approach that the governor really appreciates, really supports, making sure that our working lands continue to be working into the future. Um, the second piece there around uh, renewable energy siting, um, that was a, a big discussion in the Natural Working Lands subgroup, where how do we um, encourage, incentivize, and foster more renewable energy development at the same time we don't um, chew into working farmland, working forest land. Uh, we recognize that, that there's going to be trade-offs and um, there's going to be um, uh, spots where you do lose farmland, you do lose forest land, but how do we do it in a way that streamlines the permitting process um, and at the same time uh, balances uh, our, our working land's needs. So there's a stakeholder process that is in midstream now um, that includes uh, renewable energy developers, it includes uh, wildlife professionals, it includes uh, farmers and foresters trying to crack the, the nut on that and we expect recommendations to come back to the governor in the coming weeks and months. Uh, number two, uh, around uh, increasing our incentives for increasing carbon storage. Um, just last week, um, the governor's forest carbon task force, which was created by executive order, um, completed its work. Uh, it had been looking at incentives for around 10 months uh, the focus of that group has been in the, on the small to medium-sized landowners, so 10 acres to 10,000 acres. How do we encourage these folks, these landowners, to take a more active role in their, in their land, uh, more forestry, uh, more forest management, um, and how do we um, look toward uh, ways to, to increase more of that? So either that's um, taxation policy, is it more boots on the ground through the main forest service to get people interested? It's those types of, of activities. Um, prior to the governor putting forward that executive order, we had a discussion about why focus on this sector, this small to medium landowner versus you know, maybe some of the big land ownerships in, the, in northern Maine. And I think um, you know, how we arrived there was, number one, um, that small to medium landowner Cohort is about 30% of our total land base. As Hannah mentioned, uh, we're 90%, we're 89% forested, most forested state in the nation. So that 30%, um, the average age of those landowners is 65. And so they're reaching a, a point where um, development uh, and conversion is a, is a, is a really, um, it's on the table, it's front of the radar, and how do we um, sort of protect that, that forest land moving into the future? Um, we, we also know that only about 25% of those folks have a forest management plan. Uh, and so there is real incentive, real opportunity to encourage uh, more forest um, sequestration, more carbon sequestration through those, those landowners. And so um, after this lengthy 10-month process or so, the recommendations from this group is, are going to the governor uh, later this month. And then she'll be putting forward uh, my guess would be a series of, you know, legislative steps and administrative steps, but um, those would include uh, technical assistance. I think that that's one of the spots where we f we felt like um, additional outreach to those landowners to, to encourage them to engage in a forest management plan, to engage in forestry, was something that that needs to happen. Um, also, under number two, is a conversation around uh, regional uh, uh, carbon sequestration. And so um, 
I think that's also a really important step. We are kind of also in midstream with conversations with New England states and New York about how um, we can share um, either lessons learned or models that um, can, can uh, lead to more uh, forced uh, sequestration for Maine. Right now, we're at about 60% of our annual emissions uh, are sequestered by our forest land. If you add in um, wood products, um, that bumps up uh, into around 70, so durable wood products, and so we're looking at that as well. But those regional ideas, um, how can Maine take advantage of that, it's kind of building on uh, the model that we've seen around Reggie. And then finally, I'll just touch on briefly um, number three, which is around outreach and technical assistance. I, I did mention that just a, just a few seconds ago, but uh, broadening that out to uh, farmland as well and coastal um, land as well. You know, how do we get um, uh, more education opportunities, uh, more data, more science to these landowners, uh, wherever they may, may be, so they can take more advantage of, of these opportunities around uh, carbon sequestration and working lands. And so um, I think with that, I will stop um, and turn over to Hannah. And, and it was, as I was writing that down, it's like we practice this because as Tom says and talks about more education, data, and science to landowners, whether it's farmland owners or forest owners, uh, that's where the University of Maine and, and certainly the University of Maine Cooperative Extension come into play because we can provide that scientific research data and education to the people of the state. Uh, before I get started in how we do that, I do like to share uh, a little bit of my bias coming in as I talk uh, because it hopefully will make sense when I really talk about the opportunities of this plan and the opportunities for this state. I know climate change is a significant issue across I mean, across the world, and I'm not making light of that, but with great challenges and with crisis come opportunities, and I think Maine is really poised for those opportunities. I say that, I'm a, I'm a proud potato farmer's daughter from Washburn, Maine. I grew up in the county. Uh, to me, that is absolutely the most beautiful part of the state. We can argue about that during the breaks and whatnot, but I grew up on a potato farm. Uh, with a farmer dad who also had a woodlot. So when it was a bad farming year, you harvested the woodlot to grow the crop the next year. And again, how are we managing those commingled lands in Aroostook County? I was one of those that left the county for greener pastures. I went to the state of Florida. I thought it was gonna be for two years. I ended up staying 20 years and boomeranged back in 2019 for this position. 20 years in Florida will teach you a lot about climate change. Uh, it will also teach you what not to do in regards to climate change. I worked for the university there and for eight years we couldn't even write climate change in an email by executive order of the governor. To come back to Maine, I'm like, what? The governor has a climate change council that was mandated? It was just uh, a world of difference to me and I was thrilled to accept the invitation of Tom to serve with Pat and a wonderful group of folks on the Natural and Working Lands Subcommittee of the Climate Change Council. I learned a tremendous amount during that work and I really feel like it's focused not only the work of Extension, which I lead, but the work of the University of Maine and the University of Maine system. The University of Maine played a, a pretty critical role uh, with the Climate Change Council itself with the science and technical subcommittee and with membership in many of the working groups as well. And really this allowed the University of Maine, all the folks that were working on these different groups within the process of the Climate Council plan to come together. And I'm sure this probably occurs in your organizations as well is that you get folks who are working and are passionate on a particular subject and a lot of times they stay in their lane and they don't kind of poke their heads out and say, oh, who else is working on this or how could we work together on this? And so through the work of this plan, it really helped coalesce what was happening, especially on campus of the University of Maine, to build a stronger knowledge base of ongoing research that certainly can support this plan and also the economic recovery plan, which I feel like obviously came out of COVID but ties so nicely and critically into the work of this plan. Uh, it's allowed us to identify areas of new research and education that possibly we aren't in right now, but the, that we need to be, and figure out how to support these needs in research and education as we build out this plan. 
Uh, we are very thrilled, and, and again, this is a little selfish of me to mention because I remember it on a flip chart paper uh, in that meeting room in Augusta on page 66 of the climate plan. You will see that, and I was really pleased that this recommendation made it into the plan of establishing the University of Maine as the coordinating hub for state applied research on forestry, agriculture, and natural land related climate concerns. We need to be. The University of Maine has been around for over 100 years, and again, it's critical that the University of Maine provides the research and the education and the outreach to all corners of the state in this regard. It's what we do, it's what we're here for, and I really feel like this plan has allowed us to focus our energies now and into the future. How we're doing that, and again, I appreciate Hannah mentioning this too, there are you know, there are certain the small low hanging fruit that we can do now and then there are those bigger, you know, overarching goals that we need to be looking at. And so on page 69, they talk about some of the tools that are needed, whether it's just weather data, uh, as you can imagine, you know, the weather is changing as we look at this week of, of summer like temperatures in October. Uh, again, what are the technical tools needed you know, we know not every farmer can buy a sophisticated weather station, but could they tie into weather data that we have? You know, we're looking at partnering with agencies that maybe we've partnered with before, maybe we haven't. My uh, answer to somebody who said, hey, do you want to try to work together? Absolutely. We'll figure out how to do it later, but let's do it now. And is that in terms of sharing positions with federal or other state agencies, looking at different granting programs. So again, we can provide access to funding to especially farmers across the state to implement some of these climate related technologies or soil health related technologies that will again only help them as they grow the food that we need here in the state and certainly across the country. I think it's important to mention, you know, and, and I feel like I'm here representing agriculture, not only because, again, a proud potato farmer's daughter, and it is my favorite time of the year. Potato harvest is going well, uh, and they should be done this week, which is tremendous. You know, as we talk about the main food system, which I encompass, you know, farmers, fishers, the aquaculture harvesters, and other food processors, certainly the global pandemic showed us a lot about what we know about our food system and a lot about what we need to know about our food system. And again, as we make new uh, inputs as we look at new research, as we look at new technologies to address the issues that came out of COVID. Again, the issues that come out of climate change are going to underpin all of our thinking. There's certainly global challenges at the food supply and, and state and local challenges here, especially as we talk about transportation, especially as we talk about processing and infrastructure. Uh, just some fun facts about agriculture because my sister says I'm an agriculture nerd and I feel like you should all take some fun facts away. 10% uh, of the food uh, that Mainers consume is produced here in Maine. That's, that's pretty small uh, if we think about it, 10%. We do have a goal to increase that to 35% by 2035 and 50% by 2050. We start seeing some of these goals that really align nicely as we talk about our climate goals. Agriculture has about a $3.8 billion impact to this state. It encompasses about 24,000 jobs and 1.3 million acres. As Tom mentioned, the acreage, and I know Pat is going to mention the acreage of forestry. Again, this is significant. And I have often said now in the last year and a half or so as we have these climate discussions and we look at this beautiful state, I think the bigger question that we're all going to have to answer is what is the highest and best use of our land here in the state? You know, I'm not going to argue with Pat at all because he will win, uh, but is it forestry, is it agriculture, is it natural resources and how we enjoy our lands? I say it's all three but we've got to have the right decision makers at the table to have those decisions about what this looks like. With that, I do feel, and I did mention this, I'm, I'm annoyingly positive uh, and people kind of get me on that, but I do feel like there's extraordinary opportunities within this plan. I think there are extraordinary opportunities within this state. 
I, again, much like you, we have our networks of folks that we speak with, and I have a wonderful network, not only in New England, but across the country, of other deans and directors of extension systems. When, the, when Maine released this climate action plan, I actually got text messages and emails from some of my colleagues across the country saying, is this for real? Do you, is your state really together on climate change? And I said, absolutely, it is for real. We, they asked that because of certainly at the federal level, we're seeing increased opportunities for federal monies coming down through the USDA, through the Department of Energy, and through other areas in regards to climate change. We are so far out ahead of some of my colleague states from across the country because we have a coordinated plan of action. So when those calls for grant monies come out, when those calls for federal opportunities come out, we've already got our recommendations, our action items laid out for us. We're not coming together in a flurry and a rush to provide what we think they want to hear as far as this grant goes. We've, we've, we've got our act together and this act is this plan and I'm so thankful that we do because I feel like it's going to position Maine, it'll position the University of Maine as a leader in this research and education around climate change, especially as it relates to agriculture and our natural lands. Obviously, we're seeing a shift of agriculture across the country as well. Uh, I still talk to my friends in Florida on a daily basis. I literally do have people reaching out and saying, is there available land in Maine to grow things on because we're not going to be able to do that in Florida for too much longer. Uh, if we look at Arizona, if we look at Colorado, if we look at water issues, if we look at forest fire issues, we need to think about agriculture it, across the board in the United States and what climate change is doing to that. And again, we talk about climate migrants, individuals and households moving here. What is, what is it when individual ag operations move here? Because again, it's going to be one of the places that they can grow food and grow food well here. So we need to think about that. There's going to be a lot of opportunities for new crops, for new growth areas. And one of the things I love about Maine is while we hear the the averages of, you know, Maine's the oldest state and Maine's the, this state and that state, one of the positive things is Maine has one of the highest uh, numbers of new farmers coming in because the cost of entering farming in Maine is not cost prohibitive. You can still come in and buy some land and get started in agriculture here. So we have the highest percentage of young and new farmers here in the state. What are we going to do to support them? And again, what are we going to do to support agriculture moving forward? You know, I, I think it's a wonderful, I mentioned this before, there's a wonderful agriculture forestry interface. I think the carbon task force and the recommendations of the tar carbon task force are going to be critical. And I'm very happy that agriculture recommendations may can't come next because again, uh, I used to have a bumper sticker that said farmers are the first environmentalists and it's so true as we think about agriculture and we think about agriculture in this state, uh, I think it's only going to continue to grow and continue to diversify and hopefully continue to produce more so we can hit some of those number, higher uh, numbers in the future. And again, I'm just uh, really appreciative of this opportunity and, and for the fact that this plan didn't just get announced and then sit on a shelf. That in December of 2020 when it was released, and again, I know COVID threw the wrench and so, so much else, but these con conversations are continuing. Our Natural and Working Lands Group continues to meet. We're still working on this, thinking about this, and again, utilizing it as, as in so m many other ways, especially when it comes to what is happening at the University of Maine. So really appreciative of this opportunity and looking forward to the questions. And certainly, we'll turn it over to Pat. Well, thank you, Hannah, and rest assured, um, I live in Exeter, Maine. I'm part of a, a large dairy family, and uh, the potato farmers and the dairy in Exeter keep me in line okay. so I don't uh, uh, get over my head here. Um, well, it was quite an honor to be appointed by the governor to the um, Climate Change Council, and it's been very interesting. It's been a great experience to work with uh, wonderful people, and Hannah's done a great job the other Hannah as well yeah. as this one. Um, 
of managing the process. Um, and I'll start with uh, one of the scientists we lean on from the university, Dr. Ivan Fernandez. He's got a highly technical term that he uses when he describes trees. He says trees are the best gizmos for sequestering carbon and producing long-term storage in wood products. So gizmo is a, a highly technical term that I've grown to appreciate. But part of what we understand from his work is that 60% of the emissions from petroleum products in Maine are captured in our forests. Um, so that's a, that's a high number. And if you add uh, durable wood products, you, you, you store another 15%. So 75% of the emissions from petroleum products in Maine are uh, captured through the forest ecosystem. Um, and that's remarkable. It's a function of lots of trees and low population. But nonetheless, we'll run with that because I think it's a, a really instructive number. As an industry, we've been thinking a lot about markets and uh, the future. We established a forest opportunity roadmap um, that looked at combining the forces of the university, um, industry, uh, government, both state and federal. Um, we put together a team to look at what, are, what is the future for our industry. And we came up with a lot of ideas that came about at the same time we were thinking about the, uh, what we call the bioeconomy. And if you look at some of the, in section one, take advantage of new market opportunities. We've been uh, growing the forest products industry through bioproduct innovation is a dominant theme. And again, the university as a hub uh, of doing a lot of this research is something that we've actually identified through global consultants that we've hired, uh, looking at our markets, looking at our strengths, and they see that center of excellence as being a real attraction to other capital investments in Maine with regard to the forest bioeconomy. So it's a big part of what we see in the future. On page 68, um, the, the whole idea of the forest bioeconomy is discussed. It's a nice fall foliage picture, um, reminiscent of today. Uh, but sustaining and developing new markets for forest products is really critical for our business. Um, and we're looking for low-grade wood opportunities. Some of the things that we do now, uh, sawn timber, oriented strand board up at the Huber plants and the uh, LP plant, pulp and paper manufacturing, and just as an aside, pulp and paper is doing more with the global economy, uh, uh, climate change economy as well. We're moving from printed paper to container, container board, um, and packaging. And you, th we know through COVID that these have been very important strategies for Maine's pulp and paper industry. And that will continue into the future as we diversify. Um, we're looking for lower grade markets and medium density fiber board, like the board that IKEA uses to, to make um, um, furniture. But then there's a whole new wave of products coming online globally that uh, we're really focused on. Cross laminated timber, we've been hearing a lot about. I don't know if you've been up to Bowdoin to see the new, is it Humanities Building? Or, uh, oh, it's the Arctic Museum. It is a massive, I saw it this Friday on the way north and it is uh, just an amazing piece of wood <laughs> storing carbon and it's becoming more and more important for people to think about what goes into their homes, what kind of products are they using are they green friendly products? And we've seen um, cross laminated timber gain in popularity. We're working to find a person interested in uh, spending the capital to build a facility that makes the product here. And we're seeing oriented strand board uh, uh, really be important in the marketplace. So 
the public is thinking more and more about using uh, cross-laminated timber. Nanocellulose is up in the um, university's realm and we're finding ways to commercialize that. We're looking at pyrolysis oil. Bates College is using pyrolysis oil to heat its uh, facility right now, a portion of it. And that's a product derived from wood from a refinery in Quebec. And again, we're trying to bring those kind of uh, manufacturing facilities here. Insulated wood fiber is not, an old, not a new idea, but GoLogic is really taking over the old Madison mill and building um, products in, along those lines. And we have other uh, cellulosic sugars that can perhaps replace plastics. We have other derived fuels that are um, uh, close to taking the market. So this is the new bioeconomy that's been important to us and fits with consumer demand for uh, climate friendly products. So that's why it's, a, it's actually kind of an exciting time for our industry. I think Tom talked a lot about um, the, the lands group that was working on uh, um, incentives for small landowners uh, and uh, looking at uh, uh, expanding the Maine Forest Service Task Force. We've always been supportive of the Land for Maine's Future Program, emphasizing the working forest acquisitions versus the fee acquisition forest. So that's been really important to us. But if I cross over into other sections, I can't resist. Um, we have a strong interest in comb combined heat and power. Uh, that's an energy source that uh, is really important to the industry. When we make lumber, we make sawdust, we make chips, we make uh, bark um, shavings. So integrating all of that into closed loop systems at our sawmills is really important. So you'll see a lot of focus on combined heat and power as being an important part of our future in the industry um, and using that energy source in a, in a in a smart way uh, moving forward. Um, the other thing that I, I wanted to make sure we were talking about, um, in the report there's the discussion about a renewable fuel standard in the, uh, might be in the transportation section. And that's important to our industry because we want our fuels that are derived from wood to be qualified for the renewable, renewable fuel standard. Um, and to date, uh, the governor has been helpful, the congressional delegation, we think we're breaking through, but EPA did not recognize naturally regenerated forests as a source of uh, wood fuel for this standard. They felt that all uh, wood fuel needed to come from plantations. So that's been an interesting development, and but something we're making uh, headway with. And of course, CLT is mentioned in other sections as it relates to housing. We don't necessarily have to just build museums, but we can build multi-story uh, housing, low-income housing. Um, it's a modular building system, uses a lot of, uh, stores a lot of carbon, and uh, is a building material that you can grow. So those are some of the insights into the report that I guess I'd uh, highlight. We've been very supportive of the effort it's been uh, important to our industry. Our industry is starting to look at its carbon footprint and um, it's uh, an exciting time. There are also uh, carbon um, credit deals that are discussed about with the large landowner community, finding that balance between growing the economy the way we want to grow it and taking advantage of those carbon credits is sort of a, a interesting discussion that's taking place right now as well. So those are the, my perspectives, perspectives of the industry on the carbon report. A lot of great blueprint material in here, a lot of great directions for the state of Maine to go as far as wood and, and uh, the rural communities that are dependent on this uh, industry. So thank you.
All right, so we'll move on to some questions now. I'll uh, facilitate the microphone again if anyone has a question. Uh, before we move on, I did just want to point out uh, and give one more thanks to Hannah Pingree. Her office provided us with a number of the uh, hard copies of the Climate Action Plan. They're on tables. Uh, feel free to take it home with you, read it. Uh, I'm sure panelists throughout the day will be making uh, mentions uh, of specifics in the plan. So I just wanted to give Hannah a uh, one more thank you for providing us with those. But uh, happy to facilitate the microphone for anyone who has a question. Question is for Tom. I'm Kay Mann. I'm with the um, Community Solar Industry. And I'm very interested to hear about your task force um, talking about what we're calling thoughtful siting of community solar farms and other renewable energy facilities um, for producing either solar power or other types of renewable energy. And we're hearing a lot of um, questions from the public as we do outreach in this field about, OK, well, how much forest is being destroyed if I subscribe to your solar farm? You know, I don't want to support it if, there's, if you're going to take away farmland or forestry land. So we like to tell them there is a set of recommendations out there now. We think they might get teeth at some point. <laughs> and I'm wondering, uh, what can I tell people? Um, how likely is it that some of these recommendations will become law any time in the next couple of years? Yeah, thank you. Uh, I think um, many of these will end up becoming part of the way that um, um, solar permitting or re renewable energy permitting um, is conducted. So yeah, I think we'll see a lot of that in, in sta state statute. I mean, really what we're trying to do is find a balance where, you know, we know that um, um, there's going to be trade-offs, as I said, and so we've got to figure out how that, that, that works, you know, what does that look like. We want to first incentivize, you know, brownfield opportunities, um, you know, landfill opportunities first, and then look to sort of more sort of uh, uh, natural working lands. That's not always possible. We know that. And so, um, you know, it's just going to be kind of a careful consideration. But yeah, I think that many of these recommendations were, will end up being how we permit these projects moving forward. I had one thing I wanted to add. Patrick, you mentioned, um, you spoke about the what was happening with Go Labs up at the Madison Mill, and I was fortunate enough, uh, I think it was probably a month ago or so now, to go up there and uh, see some of the progress that's happening at the mill, but I was just wondering if you could give us a little more update when you can expect that, uh, you know, that them start manufacturing at the facility and the impact that it's going to have both on the forest products industry in Maine and also uh, how that'll benefit the Madison area. Yeah, I, um, Josh Henry is the contact that I have with uh, the group, and I know COVID set them back on their fundraising activities, but my sense is they have equipment um, brought over from Europe, and um, they have the facility. I think they have an interesting arrangement with uh, the county in terms of uh, use of that equipment and the facility. Um, I, so I'm, I'm sensing they're closer, <laughs> and, uh, but I, I don't have the update there. But I think it will probably um, consume around 250,000 uh, tons plus, you know, as it grows of wood. And the facility it's replacing was probably double that size, maybe a little bit more. Um, so it's... it's um, it's a move in the right direction to kind of restart some of these old sites that are permitted for industrial uh, work. It certainly is a help to that community to bring in the additional jobs that are going to come from that process. And uh, as they become more successful, it can scale up as well. So that's a, and I think that's what we'll see. We won't see necessarily another paper mill come to town. Um, I think the bioeconomy and our strategy as an industry is to promote diversification. Um, the paper mills we have 
are the stronger ones. They're diversifying. They're making different products. Um, but I think our economy is going to be made up of a lot of uh, uh, medium, small. Um, if we're lucky, we'll get large facilities. But that diversity will, will stabilize uh, uh, us when markets uh, change around. When printing paper went down during COVID, toilet paper certainly went up. Um, you saw, so the, it, and it and the packaging um, from that's produced in our mills. We saw a lot of Amazon orders increase. Um, so the container board was a, a good strategy for the mills to move into, and and I think you'll see um, a lot of those kind of new innovations that are are on the cusp of coming to Maine, and we're trying to encourage them, working with DECD, um, Maine and Company, uh, the university, and putting together sort of a strategy that invites people in to look at Maine. We're behind this bioeconomy con concept and we want the world to know it. We've done a scan of Europe. Uh, we're doing a scan of South America, uh, China, and other parts of the U.S. to advertise our uh, abilities here in Maine. So the particulars I don't know in general, I, I can answer that question. No, great, thank you. Uh, any other questions for the panel? All right, well, I just want to thank you guys as the panel. Uh, we are going to have a short break now before our next panelist, which is the Building, Housing, and Infrastructure Working Group. We get a great spread over here of some fruit, uh, some breakfast food, some coffee, some other beverages. So uh, please feel free to take a little break, stretch your legs, and uh, we'll see everyone back for the panel at 1045. Uh, starting with George, we're going to just have a quick introduction of everyone who's on, a, on the panel and a little bit about their background. Hey, good morning, everybody. Really delighted to be here with you today. Um, my name is George Parmenter. I guide and support Hannaford Supermarkets sustainability work. Um, we'll be focusing most of our conversation, obviously, on climate today. Uh, I've been doing that work for about a dozen years, give or take, and um, feel very fortunate to be working with the Hannaford organization uh, on this type of work. So I'm looking forward to talking more. Uh, thanks. Uh, I'm Michael Stoddard, the Executive Director of the Efficiency Maine Trust, where I've been for 11 years, um, and where Hannaford is one of the best uh, customers for energy efficiency projects in the state and always a model. So thanks, George, for what you guys do. Um, and I had the privilege of being the co-chair of the Buildings Working Group in the Maine Climate Council over the last couple of years, so was involved in the development of the stakeholder process and the, and the recommendations that came out of that work group and went to the Maine Climate Council. So happy to be here today to talk some more about that. 
And I'm Charlie Summers. I represent uh, Maine Energy Marketers Association. I'm the president and CEO, representing about 300 uh, liquid fuel dealers across the state. And I'm very pleased to be here this morning. Look forward to participating. I'm Steve Hudson. I I'm a partner with Pretty Flaherty. Um, I am counsel to the Industrial Energy Consumer Group. I also happen to serve as a member of the Buildings Inf Infrastructure and Housing Work Group that, that Mike chaired. I'm also on the uh, new Industrial Innovation Task Force that's uh, outgrowth of the Climate Action Plan. Great. Thank you, everyone. And uh, thanks again for, for being here and taking time out of your busy schedules to be panelists. Uh, so we're going to start off with a presentation from uh, Mike Stoddard. pointing at. Oh, there we go. Okay. So the first thing we did when we were on this um, working group for the Maine Climate Council was to start at the beginning, which is to figure out where the greenhouse gas emissions are coming from that are associated with the buildings and facilities sector. And uh, I circled it in the big red circle there. So um, it, it's 19% of the greenhouse gas emissions in Maine are coming from residential uh, uh, buildings, 11% from commercial buildings, and 9% from industrial. So uh, just about 40% of the greenhouse gas emissions are coming directly from those sources. So um, we spent some time thinking about what we know about what happens in those buildings to figure out where what might be causing those greenhouse gas emissions, and then that led to a discussion about what are the kinds of things you can do to try and reduce those greenhouse gas emissions, uh, you know, what technologies exist, what kind of programs are there to help, what kind of laws are there, either in our state or in other states that might be good models for us to pursue. And, you know, um, it, that part wasn't particularly hard uh, for us. We, we know that uh, we live in a cold weather state where we heat our homes and businesses um, with furnaces and boilers, typically. Uh, some amount of wood stoves, obviously, but a lot of furnaces and boilers burning. 60% uh, of our homes and businesses are uh, burning oil and another 10% or so, propane, 8% uh, natural gas, and then the rest sort of electric and biomass. So we kind of knew where, where some of those greenhouse gas emissions were coming from. On the industrial side, you know, that's different. Those are factories, manufacturing facilities. They use... Uh, principally natural gas, but some cases oil or biomass. Um, so we, we looked at all those different things and then thought about and talked about the ways that you can try to cut down on those and, and then um, handed those suggestions over to the modeling group that uh, then plugged them into their, their, their giant model to figure out what we could reasonably expect to achieve in terms of greenhouse gas reductions for the 2030 and the 2050 targets. So I'm going to talk a little bit about where we came out. Uh, these were, this is a slight uh, modification to the, the exact recommendations that came out of our working group and then got received by the Maine Climate Council itself and digested and, and sort of made some improvements made to it. But essentially, uh, the recommendations in the plan are number one transition to cleaner heating and cooling systems number two focus on existing buildings making our existing buildings more energy efficient that is primarily through weatherization insulating air sealing that kind of thing number three looking at new construction when you have that opportunity to do it right the first time what could we do for our new newly built buildings what policies and programs could we recommend there? Number four, promote climate friendly building products. So Pat, hopefully, um, you know, we get some brownie points from you guys on observing that we could be reducing our carbon emissions if we uh, used building materials that had lower, lower embodied carbon content. Number five, Accelerate the decarbonization of industrial processes. This is something that, um, as Steve referenced, he was on the work group and we worked together to talk about what could be 
done in the manufacturing sector. Uh, number six, lead by example, which is really kind of a, just take the best hits of all those prior uh, recommendations and where you have the power of the purse, where you have either local government, state government, county government, where, you, where you're putting public dollars to work, um, consider putting some restrictions on the use of those dollars so that you get these kinds of best practices and, and lower carbon outcomes. And then finally, um, there was a, a good discussion about some of the chemical properties of the refrigerants that we use um, and, and in some other places where there are HFCs. And so it was noted that we should, as a state, play our part in um, reducing emissions that might be associated with either leakage of refrigerants or just uh, poor disposal practices from refrigerants. So those were the seven general categories. And I'm going to talk quickly about them, and hopefully that will set the, the rest of the panel up to talk through what they're working on in this area. Um, so cleaner heating and cooling systems is really talking about making the way we consume our home heating and our, and our business heating for space heating and water heating, both more efficient and cleaner. Um, so if we're using fuels that have a heavy carbon content now, is there an option to switch to a lower carbon alternative? Um, and we've been very fortunate uh, as a state to, to see the development of a particular technology, which we uh, refer to generally as heat pumps, that are super efficient and they are running on electricity. And the grid that serves us here in Maine and in New England generally is relatively clean. It's quite clean and getting cleaner all the time as it switches to more and more renewable energy. And so making heat uh, as well as making air conditioning through those heat pumps is both very efficient and much, much lower carbon. So you can see the carbon difference. This is the this is the carbon emissions from making a unit of heat with a heat pump using today's grid, which is going to get cleaner. And this is what it is if they're using a furnace or a boiler, either a, a, a new one here in the orange or an existing typical um, AFUE rating for uh, oil-fired furnace or boiler. And so you can see that's a pretty big jump, and that would be one way that we could accomplish a significant amount of greenhouse gas savings. That's, I think that's about a 60% Greenhouse, uh, greenhouse gas reduction by making that switch if that's if that's appropriate for your house or business. Um, the modelers took this technology idea, this opportunity, and um, and sort of turned the dials to see how much you how much of the current consumption of heating oil and propane and natural gas we do in our state would have to be displaced and switched over to high efficiency heat pumps in order to meet the, uh, the Climate Council's targets for 2030 carbon and 2050 carbon. And these were the target, these were the numbers that they came up with that would equate with that level of displacement. So you're talking about having 130,000 homes using between one and two heat pumps by uh, 2030 and another 115,000 that have switched over completely. Uh, so they might have some kind of a backup system, uh, whether it's resistance or the old, uh, you know, resistance electric baseboard heating or a wood stove or their old natural gas or oil or propane furniture boiler they, that they might leave in place. Uh, but still, the, the, des the direction we seem to be going is towards whole house systems. Um, there were other recommendations that came out of the work group. One was to look at a renewable fuel standard. Um, I think that would impact all heating fuels, but uh, particularly was something that was advocated by the natural gas utilities. Um, efficient wood heating was also m on the list of things to consider. And then finally, uh, appliance standards, which is just a, uh, a page out of the playbook that states can do to set minimum energy efficiency standards for the kinds of appliances that we use in our homes and businesses, whether it's a dishwasher, a refrigerator, a photocopier, or whatever. And, um, and Maine has, in fact, 
adopted this legislation just last year. Um, and they also adopted a couple of years ago a target for installing 100,000 new heat pumps um, by 2025. And uh, last year, I thought I had another slide in here, but maybe I skipped it. Um, last year, Maine consumers installed 28,000 heat pumps. Um, and this is a state with only 550,000 year-round households and another uh, 100 or 150,000 business commercial spaces. So that's a very significant uptick, um, especially when you consider that the year before that, Mainers installed only 12,000 heat pump units. So we went from 12,000 to 28,000 in one year. Um, and that, that trajectory is very exciting. I mean, that tells us that we are, in fact, on a pathway to that 2030 target that we were, that we were talking about. So that's, that's what happens when the market starts to transform. People find a new kind of technology that they like. They like the way it works. They like financially how, how it works. And, um, and it's good for the environment. And so you see that the main consumers are really excited about this. And a lot of main small businesses are doing very, very well by selling and installing this, this equipment. Um, existing buildings, obviously uh, some small percentage of construction that happens or, or residential and, and commercial buildings are new each year. And we've had a bit of a building boom in this state. But that doesn't compare to the amount of existing homes and businesses that we have here in the state. And so we all are pretty familiar, I think, with the objective of weatherizing, but, you know, uh, buttoning down or uh, tightening up these homes so they don't leak so much air. And we don't, if they don't leak so much air, then we don't have to heat it so much. And if we don't have to heat it so much, then we can save energy and save greenhouse gas emissions and money. So um, one of the goals that was recommended by the working group was to double the rate of weatherization that exists in this state. And that translates into, oopsie, wrong button. Uh, that translates into uh, 35,000 homes weatherized by the end of the decade, um, which would have us at a clip of um, about 3,500 a year for each year. And that's double what we have been doing. Um, and also with a nod to um, the growing awareness of the importance of equity in all of the programs and policies that we think about. Um, there's a, an acknowledgement that at least a thousand a year should be going towards the benefit of low and moderate income Mainers. I'll try to pick up the pace here a little bit. Uh, new construction, this is not very complicated. There, this, is, uh, this is one area where the uh, regulatory approach is very effective. In fact, it's the most cost-effective way to uh, improve performance of new construction. And it's sort of the idea of getting it right the first time. So um, by, by improving and tightening the building energy codes, um, along with all the other building codes, we have a, a good opportunity to make sure that buildings have proper insulation and uh, good high efficiency heating systems and are well constructed. And that's, we recognize, going to require uh, a pretty holistic approach, including providing a lot more resources to municipalities who have code enforcement officers who need to get trained on the newest codes and the construction and building community who uh, needs to get training on what are these new codes, what are the content, and what are the best practices for complying with them. Um, and this also is where we talk about um, <clears throat> trying to do more to use our uh, forest products, uh, including mass timber and, and wood fiber insulation, potentially. Uh, this, is, this is the recommendation on industrial processes. and. Um, there was a fair amount of discussion in our group about how the industrial community in Maine has already done a lot over the last 20 years. They were really among the first to make the transition from heavier fuels to natural gas. That was a big greenhouse gas advantage when they did that. 
They've also been leaders in investing in energy efficiency improvements. There's still more that they could do. There's a lot that they could do with waste heat, um, and some of them have already done that, but there's more room, we think, for, uh, for some of those large industrials. Uh, they, there are programs offered at Efficiency Maine that will provide generous incentives and technical assistance for those projects. Um, and, but the switch from natural gas to whatever happens next that's even lower carbon than that remains a little bit of a mystery. Uh, the economics of that are not great, and the volumes that, that these industrials consume are significant. And so we concluded that the best thing to do would be to form a task force where we would collaboratively work together and, and study these issues and, and uh, learn about best practices from other states around the country and from the federal, uh, the federal DOE labs and see, see what kinds of things might make sense for us in Maine. So we've just kicked off that industrial group task force and I'm really looking forward to to the work that we can do together on that. Uh, leading by example, I, I, I think I already touched on this, but again, um, the states and the local governments and certainly school uh, districts are doing a fair amount of new construction, and when they do that, they have a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to make sure that those buildings are, are very energy conscious and, and carbon conscious, and so they, um, they have a great opportunity, and we're uh, just getting going on doing some work with the state in, uh, regarding their buildings to also retrofit where they have the opportunity uh, to do so cost effectively. Uh, and then I think this might be the last one, but um, as I mentioned before, one of the recommendations was to make the pivot away from some of the refrigerants that we use and, and other chemical compounds that we use in uh, insulation and blowing agents and some other kinds of um, substances that have these very high HFC content, which has an extremely high global warming potential. Um, they do make alternatives that have lower global warming potential, so that's a, a recognized way that you can cut down on your greenhouse gas emissions. And um, luckily, I think for us, we have this parallel, uh, this parallel strategy going where the federal government is really leading and, and uh, moving tighter restrictions so that the industry will, will gradually phase these out and switch over to the newer, lower HFC products. But Maine has a companion piece now that we can use for enforcement, and uh, that was enacted just this past year and has been uh, put in the hands of the Maine DEP to uh, establish through regulations. So I think that covers it. What else did I have here? Oh, this is the one slide just to kind of graphically illustrate Maine's uh, path on heat pumps. And I show it mostly because I think it's good news and it's nice to hear a little good news from time to time. Here's where we started out in 2013 with a little pilot project to see if heat pumps, this new generation of heat pumps would work in Maine's cold weather because a lot of people said they wouldn't. They said you should maybe use them in the shoulder seasons, maybe you know September, October, November, but after that you want to cut it off because the old ones didn't make heat well when it got really cold out, even when it got below 32. But the new ones will make heat efficiently even when it's minus 15 degrees outside. And the truth is in most of Maine, it just doesn't get that cold that often even when it might drop below minus 10, minus 15. It's only for an hour or two usually. And so uh, heat pumps actually can do the job. And that's what we're learning. And that's what you're seeing here, I think, with the customer satisfaction levels. We take customer satisfaction um, surveys every month. And, um, and I think it's 80% of people are scoring it eight or out of, at a score of zero to 10, that they are uh, highly satisfied um, with their heat pumps. And so um, we just this past year went from here, you see this jump up to there, which is uh, this most recent year. And um, I, that's why I say, I think it's encouraging to see this sort of viral uh, popularity of this new technology. It works well. It does the job, it saves people money, 
and uh, it makes their homes and, and businesses more comfortable. So this is a great story. It's, it's, uh, it's helping people out and it's gonna be saving a lot of uh, carbon. So um, that, that's the trajectory we're shooting for. And these different colors just reflect the different customer segments that are being served by these heat pumps. And uh, uh, the last uh, slide, which is also I think a, a good piece of news, and I'm sorry the colors are a little washed out here, but this is a map of Maine um, based on population density from the U.S. Census. So anyone who knows this state will recognize it mostly, you know, up here in the county, pretty sparsely populated. Uh, you know, here's Baxter State Park, a few moose, not a lot of people. Here's the, you know, coastal area, pretty densely populated where we are now. Um, where are the heat pumps? Oh, and here's the median household income. So um, higher median household income along the coast, uh, less so up here in the interior. But where are the heat pumps going per, on a per capita basis? On a per capita basis, look at where the heat pumps are most densely installed. That's a great story. You know, if you're worried about equity, if you think that maybe this is just a popular product with the wealthy folks, um, that's not what's happening through this program. Um, so I think this tells a great story that we can feel good about when we run a program and we provide financial incentive to try and get people to convert to a, next a new technology. Um, it's not just uh, about the, the, the folks uh, in the southern part of the state who might have the means to do that. This is a technology that works for folks at all income levels, in all building types, and in all parts of the state. Um, and, and the satisfaction levels are extremely high. So it's a, it's a hopeful and a positive story, and I'll, I'll leave you with that thought. Thanks. Thanks, Michael. I don't actually know how to switch it to the... Oh, there you go. Oh. Automatic. Good morning, everyone. As I said, I'm really pleased to be here with you this morning. Uh, I'm going to give kind of a high-level flyover of... Um, and how Hannaford as business is approaching this topic of climate change. Um, I'm, I feel I'm a little bit underdressed, I think, for the room. I apologize for that. This is my first time out in a long time. So that's my, and if you could see what business casual looks like at my house, then you, this is a big step up, I guarantee you. So uh, just to remind you who Hannaford is, Hannaford Supermarkets, um, so we're based here in Scarborough, Maine. We operate 184 uh, full service supermarkets in the Northeast. We operate in Maine, New Hampshire, Vermont, uh, western part of Massachusetts, and kind of the eastern northern part of New York. Uh, most of our stores have pharmacy. We have 67 stores in Maine. We consider this kind of home territory. And uh, according to the uh, state of Maine, we're the second largest private employer in Maine. So, I, as I said, I'm kind of here to talk to you a little bit about um, how we talk about how we uh, manage sustainability in our business, but most specifically, more specifically about climate impact. So um, we take very, uh, very seriously our responsibility to act as a good neighbor and a positive influence in the communities we operate. Um, this means we set ambitious goals um, in our business. And um, as a matter of context to, to what I'm about to share, um, we treat sustainability very much like a business process, just like we track and manage sales and we track and manage uh, labor and uh, inventory. And what that means is we have long-term strategic goals. We set interim targets. We track our progress quarterly. When we're not on track, we try to uh, remediate to get back on track. And sustainability is exactly the same function for us. It's very much a business function and it's embedded in our business. So we have four um, focus areas in our business, and you're looking at them there. They're providing um, more uh, healthy products to our customers. In fact, improving the sales of healthy uh, products to our customers. Um, providing uh, responsibly uh, sourced and grown products and, and providing more transparency about those products. And then um, reducing our our waste and eliminating hunger. We'll touch on that in a bit as it relates to climate. And then um, 
really diving right into our, our climate work uh, properly with telling you about our science-based uh, target goals. So I think an area that um, kind of sometimes gets overlooked when we're talking about um, climate is food waste. And I know it's not exactly on topic for the working group here, but um, something like 35 to 40 percent of all food that's either grown or produced never gets eaten by anyone. And um, it's not only just the food waste that that's the problem here. So that food gets wasted, but also all the inputs to that food get wasted. You think about the fertilizer, the water, the labor, the transportation, all those have climate impacts as well. So when food does get wasted, it typically ends up in the landfill. And uh, when it decomposes, it creates methane. Methane is a powerful greenhouse gas, and that ends up in the atmosphere. If food waste were a country, it would be the third largest uh, 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 greenhouse gas emitter uh, globally after the U.S. and China. And um, we, we spent a lot of time working on our food waste and just this past year accomplished a multi-year uh, goal to keep 100% of our food waste out of landfills. So how do we do that? Well, first we try not to have food waste if we can help it. We do that through inventory practices and safe handling in our stores. But uh, beyond that, when we do have food waste, uh, we partner with um, folks like Good Shepherd Food Bank here in Maine, and then other regional and uh, state food banks across our network to ensure that when we have safe, edible food we can't sell, that that gets uh, to people who need it most uh, uh, as a hunger relief effort. We also partner with hundreds of small-scale farmers across our footprints to uh, donate food scraps for animal feed. And the idea there is uh, food, uh, food waste to create more food. And then finally, when that's not possible, we partner with uh, AgriCycle Energy. It's located right here in Maine, Exeter, Maine. It's a fifth uh, generation dairy that has a dairy farm, about 1,500 uh, head, and uh, a biodigester. They take our food waste from our stores. They get it out of the packages. They combine it with waste from the dairy farms, it's called manure, and uh, put it in the digester, create methane, and burn uh, uh, generators, uh, burn that methane created in generators to create uh, green energy. So um, that's kind of how we handle the food waste portion of this. And then I think um, how you might see this in our stores every morning, every associate is uh, making their way through the fresh portions of our stores, the stuff that's more susceptible to um, going out of code, removing products from the shelves that, that shouldn't be sold, that shouldn't be there. And um, we get that separated and rescue it, and uh, they follow that hierarchy, you know, basically feeding people, feeding animals, and then um, recycle everything else. So that is how we work on food waste. So the next big topic for us, obviously, we want to cover today um, is uh, climate impact. So not a surprise to anyone here that uh, supermarkets are very energy intensive buildings. So they're very well lit, um, they're, they're that way on purpose so you can see what you're buying. You might walk into one of our stores and you'll smell something cooking in the bakery and there might even be a slight chill in the air on a balmy August afternoon. Um, the fact is we're simultaneously cooking, cooling, or, or warming things throughout our building all day long and that takes a lot of energy. Um, we've had uh, greenhouse reduction goals for many, many years. Um, those goals were usually a percent reduction of our um, greenhouse gases, and there was a 30% reduction meant to be met by 2020. More recently, those goals have been supplanted by our new work to um, create science-based climate targets to have an absolute reduction in our, um, our greenhouse gas emissions that are in line with the 1.5 degrees uh, centigrade threshold created by the Paris Accord. So we've tied our uh, our climate emissions uh, pr proportionally to what it would take for us to, to uh, be in line with the 1.5 degrees centigrade. Um, so just hearkening back to my earlier context statement, so those goals are set. There, uh, there are absolute reductions. We have targets out through 2030 to hit certain um, absolute uh, greenhouse gas emission targets. We have uh, interim targets for those that we review quarterly with our uh, senior management. And when we're not on track, we try to figure out why we're not on track and fix that. 
So uh, a little bit more about that when we talk about how we're managing that. So uh, the other thing that we have recently um, come to understand is uh, we have a bunch of um, community solar projects in place right now that will become active in 2022. When those are fully in place, Hannaford will be about 75% renewable energy and we're really excited by the prospect of kind of trying to figure out like what it would take to get us to 100% and how quickly we could do that. So maybe more on that uh, towards the end of the year. So just um, talking a little bit about our past and um, hearkening back to some of Michael's comments about new construction. So if, if we take you back in time to 2009 and not that far from where we are today on the site of the old Coney High School, Hannaford built the most environmentally friendly supermarket in the world at that time. It earned a Platinum LEED certification and was really created to be a living library, a uh, living laboratory for us rather, to try things that we wouldn't ordinarily try to see what worked and what was commercially uh, feasible in our business. And you know, I'm happy to report to you that many of the things that we did back then are the very things that we employ today to limit our um, greenhouse gas emissions. And most of that is around uh, energy efficiency. And those are things like uh, letting more natural light into the store, so you need less uh, uh, lighting added there. Putting doors on refrigerated cases seems so obvious. You know, you wouldn't leave the refrigerator door off your refrigerator at home to make it easier to get to the milk, but that's you know, for a lot of years, is how supermarkets ran. So uh, putting doors on cases is key. Installing LED lights, which is a technology that continues to uh, improve over time. Um, and some of our cases have activated, uh, motion activated LED lights. And um, uh, Michael mentioned this a bit, I think also is this idea of uh, re-engineering our refrigeration systems to capture the latent heat from those systems, um, and I'm not going to try to, I'm not a technical guy, so I won't even try to explain it, but suffice to say that when you cool something, you create a lot of heat, that heat gets moved into the back room of our stores, and in, uh, 10 years ago, that heat would have just been dissipated into the atmosphere through the, the, the rooftop units. Now we capture that heat and we use it to warm the store and uh, warm the domestic hot water in the store. So. Um, Again, touching on something that Michael said earlier about refrigeration gas. So the other thing that we've learned over time is refrigeration happens to be a pretty good chunk of our um, climate impact footprint. Obviously, ref refrigeration, there's a lot of refrigeration in our supermarkets. Um, we, we have centralized systems that uh, pump refrigeration throughout the store. And if you think about um, global warming potential of these refrigeration gases and the chemicals that make them. If you think about carbon as a unit of one, some of the more conventional, normally used refrigeration gases in uh, use today can have three or 4,000 times that impact. It's pretty significant. So in 2013, um, we built the first supermarket in the U.S. to use natural refrigeration, that's CO2, and that was built right here in Turner, Maine. Um, and really that was built, that innovation was um, embraced as a way to see if it would work in our climate. There were also naysayers that said CO2 wouldn't work in this climate. Well, it does work. It works quite well. It was also a way to kind of create incentive for the industry to move in that direction, knowing that there would, would be a market for the elements of the system that they sell if, if it were available. So since then, we've designed and opened two more stores with um, very low GWP refrigeration gas. Uh, North Berwick, Maine is one, and then uh, one in upstate New York. And this is an area where the technology in the market is changing very, very quickly. Uh, we're, we're well on the way to have um, gases in the area of five, uh, a GWP of five available that wouldn't require specialty systems that could be used in the systems that we have today. So that's refrigeration, and then you know another big piece, and I, I noted as Michael was talking that he said something like 54% of the emissions are related to transportation, so we have a huge truck fleet. Um, you'll see our trucks everywhere in the state. We're, we have stores as far north as Caribou, Maine, and as far south in the state as York. Our fleet travels 6.3 million miles a year in the state. Um, and some of the things that we've been working on more recently, uh, or up till now, is uh, all of our trucks are ordered with special diesel engines that, that maximize efficiency. Uh, we have low uh, resistant uh, tires on our trucks and our trailers and the 
the tractors have these uh, uh, wind deflecting uh, elements that, that make them slippery on the road to the air, not to the pavement. Um, we use uh, software and um, uh, adaptive cruise control on all of our trucks. And our tractors and trailers are equipped with uh, low drag um, disc brakes. All of these things really are meant to, to have the fleet run more efficiently. And there's really a good business reason for that because if we use less diesel, then we're, we can get our food to the stores less expensively. But also there's a big climate impact to this stuff. And um, more recently, we've been interested in more alternative fuels. We're partner, partnering with Maine Standard Bio, and Roger's here in the uh, audience here somewhere, way up back there. Uh, and Roger brought to us uh, uh, a pilot project where we're putting 5% biodiesel out of one of our distribution centers in Saco. And this is going extremely well. Uh, and in the spring, we hope to expand that to more uh, distribution centers where, where the fueling happens so that it can be in more trucks. Um, so we're really excited about that. And then more recently, um, our fuel team has been talking about the, the brave new world of more alternative fuels like electrification and like hydrogen. Um, and um, you know, it's really exciting because the team is excited about this. They see that that's the future and they're really uh, going out of their way to embracing it. So we're really looking forward to um, continuing our work in the transportation area also. And then um, lastly here, and I put this one under the heading of how we kind of enable our customers to make more uh, healthy and uh, sustainable decisions in their life if that's what they choose. So um, something like a million Mainers walk through the doors of our store. Um, I think that's, could that be every week? We're going to say it's every week. Um, the, and um, part of what we try to do is without being uh, you know, overbearing about this is make it easy for our customers to make those choices that wish to make them. So we do have electric vehicle chargers, um, a lot of those in partner with uh, Efficiency Main at our stores. We think DC fast charging is really an amenity that our customers uh, want now and are going to want even more in the future. We're excited about being able to offer that. Um, we make it easy for our customers to find locally sourced products that are going to have a, 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 a lighter uh, environmental and uh, climate impact. Uh, to find locally grown products, we, we partner with 135 local farms and hundreds and hundreds of local producers. Uh, we have a large selection of plant-based foods and we try to make those easy for folks to find that want to adopt a more plant-based diet. Um, and if you're interested in composting at home, we partner with Garbage to Garden in the communities that have that uh, available so you can buy the starter kits at our stores. And um, we try to educate our customers and, and um, teach them about what we're doing uh, as a kind of an example of, of things that they can do at, at home. So um, I think that was a pretty good high level flyover and I'm gonna stop there and um, kind of hand off maybe to Charlie. Thank you, George. Thank you very much uh, for the opportunity to be here this morning. Uh, many of you know me, know my background. Uh, I've served in the state legislature as Secretary of State and been involved in uh, the political world for a long time and have done a number of things. But the thing that uh, I find myself being most proud of uh, these days is the ability to work for Maine Energy Marketers Association. Main Energy Marketers Association, as I mentioned when we were introduced, is a group of uh, uh, retail and wholesale uh, liquid fuel dealers. I uh, represent over 300 as well as uh, several associate members. And these are, are men and women who have run, in many cases, generational businesses, businesses that have been around Maine for a very long time. They all have a stake in our environment and the stake in this state's economic future, which is why uh, they are environmentalists at heart. Uh, you might find that odd, uh, odd to hear uh, coming from someone representing the, the liquid fuel industry. But if you think about this industry that started uh, over a century ago pulling wagons full of coal, the big uh, innovation at that time was when half of the year they could haul ice and uh, they, they actually doubled their business, in effect. 
but they were always reaching for the next fuel. Every fuel we have, they considered to be a bridge fuel. And so they went from coal, they went to oil, they went to today's ultra low sulfur, sulfur oil, bioheat, which uh, Roger, and, and I've worked with Roger and, and Jarman at Main Standard Biofuels uh, to ensure that uh, bioheat is uh, first and foremost on our customers' minds. But our, my members understand that the customer defines value. And when the customer is looking for that next technology, my members have always been ahead of the curve on that, which is why uh, we have uh, ultra-efficient boilers and furnaces, which is why in our school, Maine Technical Education Center, we train our, the next generation of HVAC technicians with the most technologically advanced equipment to include heat pumps. We work with Michael on heat pumps to include pellet stoves, to include bioheat, to include uh, the promise, I think, of, of our energy future, and that is EL, ethyl butylate, which is made from biomass, which is a, a carbon neutral fuel. We have been working very, very hard to ensure that our technicians are trained in that. In fact, uh, with Michael and Jarman, uh, they are just about to deliver, a, a, I'll say a load, of biofuel uh, so that our students that we graduate uh, every three and a half months into careers that are very well paying, very uh, much in demand careers, uh, so that our students are trained with the latest fuels, with the latest technologies. We are constantly moving the ball forward in that regard, which is why uh, when I mentioned ethyl and working with uh, Biofine and uh, um, uh, Mike Casada and the university, uh, we have uh, paired together with the center president uh, to ensure that that the work of EL goes forward. EL and and uh, we have a bond, a forty million dollar bond uh, sponsored by Senator Jackson, that will provide funding for. Uh, pilot projects so that uh, EL, which by the way, Biofine just uh, uh, about two months ago announced their first full production facility in the state in Lincoln, Maine, and they will begin making up to three million gallons of EL a year, uh, which is so that biofuels like EL, like what uh, Jarman and Roger produce at Maine Standard Biofuels, can be brought into the forefront so that the university can have the funds necessary to make sure that we are constantly grasping for that new technology, for that next fuel. Uh, because again, my members look at this uh, not only from an economic standpoint, but as a customer defining value and the importance of a broad-based energy portfolio. We don't believe that entire electrification is the answer here because we cannot set this state up, we cannot set our country up for a single point of failure. We all saw what happened in 1998, and I know Dana was here in 1998, and the ice storm when our grid was down. We saw what happened in Texas less than a year ago when the grid was down. We saw what happened with the Colonial Pipeline. We saw what happened in India when China hacked into their power grid and shut it down during the midst of the pandemic. We don't believe a single point of failure in the case of full electrification is the answer. We need a broad-based energy portfolio, one that includes electricity one that includes hydro, one that includes biofuels, to make certain not only that our consumers have the choice, but that it, we have, in some cases, a redundant system. So that if one side of it goes down, we have a backup system. Mainers are very pragmatic and very common sense in, in that regard. It's true, uh, we help and to train people to install heat pumps, but most Mainers have heat pumps and they have a wood stove and they have a fireplace, and they have their boiler, be it gas or oil, because they know that that's what's necessary to get through a main winter. And we know that we don't want to give up our own independence, uh, the rugged independence that this state is known for, because we have to make sure that we are good stewards of the environment, we have to make sure that we are good stewards of our economy, and we have to make sure that when we think about our energy future, that is inextricably tied, not just to our economic future, but to our state security and our national security. And with that, I would be happy to pass it off to Steve and uh, look forward to answering any questions you might have. Thank you.
Thank you, Charlie. <clears throat> Again, I'm Steve Hudson with Pretty Flaherty. I'm here today uh, representing the Industrial Energy Consumer Group, who I represent in both regulatory and legislative matters um, uh, and have done for several years. Um, let's see if I can get this right. So the IECG is a trade association of Maine's largest energy consumers. It's been operating for uh, more than 36 years. Uh, unlike other trade associations, we're very active, not just in the state, but on regional and on federal uh, energy issues on behalf of our members. Um, we've been, we've, uh, some of the themes of our 36 years is uh, energy choice as a consumer right, the right to self-generate. That was one of the foundational principles of the uh, IECG and it continues to this day. Um, we were very proud of being able to do Reggie Wright for Maine. We were one of the, at the time, the only business group that stepped, stepped up to help make sure that Reggie was going to happen in a way that worked for the state of Maine. There was great cooperation with, uh, led by Hannah Pingree, uh, Maine's DEP uh, was fantastic to work with and that's when I first met Mike Stoddard back in the day. Um, and we're very proud of that effort. Um, reforming energy efficiency, um, the IECG was active in um, undoing some inefficient prior uh, energy efficiency efforts in the state and creating the Efficiency Main Trust. Uh, we think Michael and his team do fantastic work and, and uh, the state should be glad to have them doing that work. Um, we have lobbied for years to support increased natural gas supply to the state of Maine. Um, we have uh, very low cost uh, natural gas that's very close to us in Pennsylvania. We just can't get it here because through lack of the interstate pipeline capacity. Uh, and that's gonna lead, we're gonna see some issues probably this, uh, this winter where uh, we're gonna have shortages and you may see businesses shutting down because electricity prices are gonna get so high, it'll be difficult for people to be able to operate. Um, uh, and then we also were proud of the fact that we lobbied to add uh, the, to the PUC's mandate to providing uh, uh, reliable um, uh, electric and safe electric service that they would add, add lowering energy costs as one of their mandates. So uh, that's the kind of things that the IECG has been working on. Um, but we have started our own climate initiative called Get Maine Climate Right. Um, and it's uh, nothing necessarily rocket science, but it was, it was the first where, the, where a group of industrials in Maine stepped forward and put out for the public to see what our commitment were and what we thought guiding principles ought to be in addressing climate, uh, the climate change challenge. Um, we, we pushed the idea of the biggest climate bang for the buck because we think that there, there is so much work ahead of us that we need to do the most cost effective things first. We need to harvest all the low hanging fruit because there are gonna be much more difficult things to do in the past. We can't afford to waste money now. Um, and we think that if we, if we spend the time to be thoughtful and to, and to talk to all serious parties about it, we can uh, reduce greenhouse gas emissions without destructive controversy. But what's important there is that we avoid making climate policy mistakes and when, they, when we do make those mistakes, because we will make them, that we have the courage to fix them promptly. Uh, we have a couple of things um, that recently that have happened, um, one of which is Michael mentioned the uh, uh, HFC bill. We, I was proud to work on uh, pa passing that bill on behalf of a, of a different client, but, um, at the, but yes, less, less than a year later, the legislature passed a PFAS phase out bill. Everybody wants to phase out PFAS, but that definition that was used, in fact, is going to, is going to require phase outs of some of the, some of the replacements for uh, HFCs uh, that, were pat that were going to be relied upon in the, in the first bill. So we have to fix that. And, and, and we have to not be afraid of fixing our mistakes. We have to own up to them and just fix them. Um, you know, we, we think that we've, we're on a good path to getting low cost grid scale renewables, but frankly, we're, we're paying too much for uh, um, the distribution scale the, um, uh, uh, renewables, and we need to figure out how to, how to accomplish that dis distributed generation in the most cost-effective way where it actually adds value to the grid as well as to the hosts or the off-takers. Um, and then, uh, and then the, and the last one might be an example of uh, uh, this referendum that we're all gonna be asked to vote on in, in uh, a few weeks. Question one, 
where the IACG has been supportive of that project. We were actually supportive, we've been supportive of a line uh, uh, linkage with Quebec for uh, since 1987. Um, so it wasn't that project, it wasn't this project that's up in front of us now, but we were in support of uh, projects like that to create the kind of linkages we need. And the fact that uh, that poorly um, drafted legislation, in fact, would, would affect the growth in transmission that we're going to need to have to solve the climate crisis in the most cost-effective way. So um, we think the strategic beneficial electrification is a superior climate strategy available now. I think there's, it's fair to say that we need diversity and innovation in, in the solution set that we're going to pursue um, because we, of the fact that um, it's not going to be a one-size-fits-all but there's a lot to be done on beneficial electrification, a lot to do with further greening of our grid. Um, the, uh, uh, we also think that the burden of reducing greenhouse gas emissions has got to be borne proportionally by, the, by the, uh, all fossil fuel users. Uh, we came to, our, my organization came together because of concern over primarily uh, electricity prices, but we're, we've, we've expanded to be concerned about the cost of energy across the board for our members. Um, but we have to realize that the burdens so far have fallen disproportionately on electric electricity consumers who have funded much of the good work that Michael and his group have done. Um, but you, know, you have to understand that a lot of that is going to displacement, some of that's going to displacement of fossil fuels. So we just need to make sure that everybody participates in implementing the solutions. Um, so. Just to remind everybody about, the, Hannah's already talked about it, Michael's already talked about it, I don't need to go into it. I just want to uh, focus on the fact that when you look at the sectors um, that are, they're, they're EIA sectors, and then we look to the DEP biennial, biennial reports in terms of setting the baseline and then looking at where we are in terms of percent reductions, you can see that industrial um, has already exceeded the 2030 goal. Some people would know, would say, well, part of that's because we shut down paper mills in Millinocket and Lincoln. But I would, I would point out that you have to look at the total value of forest products in the state and, and the fact that, you know, when I first showed up in the state, it wasn't unusual to see um, paper mills having, productive paper mills producing half a ton of, of, of paper per, per person per day. Now we're uh, roughly eight times that. Um, so you have to, a lot of it has been increases in productivity that have helped us um, reduce, in addition, uh, a lot of the remains rural manufacturers rely on biomass cogeneration, which, which uh, Pat Strzok talked about, as well as they led the switch to, to natural gas and, and away from uh, uh, coal and oil. Um, but you can see there's a lot of work to be done. Transportation has actually increased. Um, commercial has, has, got a has had some reduction but still has a challenge, and residential has effectively done nothing even in spite of uh, now, this is 2017 data, so we're, we're going to see when, when, when some of the, uh, when we get to the point where we're picking up some of the work that Michael's doing, we, I would think we'd see some uh, residential uh, reductions. But what's next? So in our view, uh, Michael's work group focused, correctly focused primarily on the non-industrial efforts required to meet the 2030 goals. Um, and I mentioned the commercial sector is going to have to step up and get some work done. I think they've got to get another 28% reduction to meet their share of the 2030 goals. But residential and transportation are st essentially starting from scratch. Michael's jump-started some of the, the residential side. You know, uh, we'd, we've seen a lot of good work on, on EV infrastructure, but it's just, it's, it's not enough. Um, and uh, the other thing that we think is, while we're growing those new renewables, whether they're distribution level or whether they're grid scale, we have, to, we have to make sure that it's both diverse and cost effective. You know, every penny per kilowatt hour that we pay above market is going to hurt both Maine's economic competitiveness and, and, and that of its businesses, but also it hurts low income Mainers. So, um, and then it, the, that, that penny raises barriers to the growth of additional beneficial electrification. So we're, we end up uh, hurting ourselves in, in several ways. So, what is industrial, the industrial sector going to have to do? We've got to get another 50% reduction from what where we're at today by 2050. And that's, of course, every, as we go down that path, uh, every, every next step is going to be more difficult and probably more costly. We think the uh, industrial uh, task force is a good, is a good starting point. Um, it's only had one meeting so far. The second meeting will be coming up. 
But you know, generally we have to look at, at sustaining the operations of our existing industrials. We spend a lot of time trying to, trying to attract new and not necessarily enough time focusing on keeping our existing uh, in, uh, manufacturing sector healthy and growing. Um, but Michael's team and the folks at MTI and FAME are good resources. We're hoping that that combination of state and federal funding uh, will help make more projects available for existing facilities. But we also need to have state policies that support vibrant industrial activity. And uh, we spend a lot of time complaining, uh, studying tax expenditures within the state. That is, uh, at some point, we have to just decide that we're that um, not to continue to throw things like uh, the Betty program in, into question every other year because it ends up um, reducing the effectiveness of that program. Um, and we also have to work together to attract um, uh, public policy, public and private investment in opportunities to create regional solutions. We're going to have individual projects at individual facilities. Those are great. Those are one-offs that make, that make great sense for that facility and keeping it as part of the main uh, landscape. But we have to look at, at, increasingly, we're going to have to look at how do we implement a solution that, that solves a, the problem for more than one location. And whether that's growth of uh, hydrogen or growth of biofuels and being able to, to uh, have hubs that end up serving more than one facility, um, that, that's going to be an important thing. Um, I, I would note that beneficial, electri beneficial electrification is not going to get the job done alone for the industrial sector. Energy efficiency is incredibly important. That's, that's the first step. But biomass, cogeneration, co natural gas, re renewable natural gas, and hydrogen are all going to play a role. And I think we're going to see that it's going to be the kind of diverse future that Charlie mentioned. So thank you, and I look forward to answering questions. Thank you guys very much. So if anyone has a question, please just uh, raise your hand, and I'll bring the microphone over to you. So Steve, is the 50% reduction goal that you were just talking about, is that, has that run through the MACE grid that Michael uses for determining what's cost effective for reductions? Or, or is that just a goal that you haven't run through that no, that's, screen yet? That's, um, that 50% is looking at where, based on the 2020 data in the 2020 report, where industry is today and where it needs to get to meet its 2050 goal means, we're gonna, means the industrial sector is going to have to have another 50 roughly 50% reduction. Yeah, so it's not part of, you know, so the MACE analysis, the maximum uh, achievable cost-effective uh, energy efficiency, first of all, it's limited to savings of electricity or natural gas. Mm -hmm. So um, we look at what we think is the maximum cost-effective potential from the industrial sector every three years, and it's not going to do that. So wh whatever makes that happen is going to have to be incremental, significantly incremental above what the standard energy efficiency programs that we would be able to run. Uh, Steve, uh, just a quick follow-up question with you. Could you elaborate on your uh, tail end of your presentation when you talked about biomass being part of the future? Could you elaborate uh, biomass, biomass being part of the future? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, I guess in the interest of, of full disclosure, I started my, my career, legal career, in, in the uh, uh, paper and forest products industry, and I've been in and out of it uh, up to today. And so I am a big promoter of that industry. I think it's sustainable. I think it provides incredible, incredibly good jobs um, in uh, some of the most rural parts of our state uh, where there aren't other economic opportunities that are anywhere near as good. So I'm, I'm definitely biased. But I would also note that biomass cogeneration uh, um, in, in today's mills is very efficient. Um, it's low pr polluting and it's renewable. Um, and anybody who's had to try to maintain a, uh, 
their lawn in the face of the encroachment of the, of the, of the main forest understands that the, that the uh, forest will come will win if you leave, if you just uh, leave it alone. I, the, the main uh, forest products industry is very sustainable. So I am concerned when I see people in Maine think uh, want to raise that point and make and make that argument. I think what we what Maine needs to do is frankly have. Uh, ensure that, as Governor Mills and her staff have done, make sure that, that we all support uh, efficient uh, use of biomass, whether it's biofuels or whether it's, it's uh, residual uh, wood uh, being burned in large industrial uh, facilities. Um, it, that's good for the state and it's good and, and it's climate neutral. Thanks. And Tim, you know, just to, to follow on with uh, what Steve was saying, uh, with the biomass, with uh, and I mentioned EL, ethyl ethylene, which is made from waste wood, and it's made from uh, the wood you know on the on the forest floor. It's made from cardboard uh, from the waste stream, and it is uh, not by my judgment, but by uh, the university's 100% uh, carbon neutral. I mean, it's something that can be put in people's boilers today, and with minor modifications. And we we've, we've used it at the University of Maine Presque Isle. We used it. Some, Homes in, in the north it doesn't uh, uh, have any adverse effects on it. It's, it's one of those issues uh, that I think is, as Steve said, it's not only important to the economy of the state, but it's one of those rare issues where uh, people of all political stripes, I think, can be on the on the right side of this. Uh, one one for Michael, if I may, is the thirty thousand heat pumps installed. Is that just the mini splits, or is it the uh, also include the heat pump water heaters? It does not include heat pump water heaters, but it does include all configurations of heat pump technology. So not just mini splits, but also multi heads and uh, VRFs that we would apply, for example, in an elementary school or a small office building. So we've converted all of those units to what they would be if they were a, winning, a mini split. And so in one year, we did 28,000. I think we're up to about 75,000 statewide at this point. So Steve and Charlie said that, um, you know, we'll be using liquid fuels for a while, likely. Well, Michael, your slide said that uh, you're looking at investigating renewable fuel standards. Where are you in that process? Um, I know places like New York just passed a biofuel mandate for heating oil, and they're also looking at a low carbon fuel standard. So interested in seeing where Maine is in that process. We're going to be using liquid fuels. Uh, how do we incentivize greener and cleaner liquid fuels? <laughs> So to the question of where does that stand, um, it, it, it's an idea. It's a, it's, a, it's a recommendation of one possible policy tool. And um, I'm, I believe a renewable fuel standard, um, as described in the Climate Council process, is a little bit distinct from the low carbon fuel standard. Um, uh, but I'm not sure. Um, and so I think we would want to look at what those other states are doing and see if, um, you know, what elements of those policies and programs would be the best fit here. And I also think it's a little tricky right now because there's so much activity going on at the federal level. You know, if, if the feds finally were to move uh, and take some kind of comprehensive action, that might address the situation in a way that would sort of moot the, ne the necessity of having a, uh, one of those fuel standards. But I, I do think you, you point out, and Steve sort of pointed it out also, there, there's a little bit of a, a gap. There's an inequity, uh, incompleteness in, in how we've set things up so far. We've regulated the carbon in the power plant sector, okay, we checked that box, but we haven't done the same with any of the other fuels. And so at some point here, before too long, we're gonna have to take a more comprehensive approach. Speaking about a comprehensive approach, um, <clears throat> You may or may not have heard of one of the things that's being uh, um, considered now by, by the Senate, 
Finance Committee, <clears throat> which is the, the pricing of carbon and increase, steadily increasing price on carbon with uh, revenues um, returned equally across the board. So a steadily increasing price on carbon emissions is a kind of a comprehensive approach that would, would leave it up to all industries. Um, Han um, Hannaford, including all of us, <laughs> the paper industry and so on, to make their own um, uh, thoughts about how to deal with uh, a, a, a steadily increasing price on carbon. Have any of you considered how that would affect the industries that you're particularly involved with? Well, I, I think because it's such a comprehensive question uh, it, that it would require a very comprehensive uh, response to that, but uh, I, I would imagine we'll, we'll see that start to unfold in the next uh, several years. Yeah. Well, one of the things that I, I think is important is, is, is you look at, at who is paying for that and, and wh what are you doing with the money that, is, that, that comes back to it. The idea of a carbon tax that gets returned to consumers, so that the idea being there that it's that the consumers are going to end up financing the changes for the industries that are because it'll be represented in the in the cost of the products that they're using. So th it's theoretically, it's you're just sending signals to the marketplace, but you're essentially the consumers are paying for it, but they're, they're getting it back. As as I get very nervous, uh, Maine's been very good about making sure that the Reggie money doesn't go somewhere other than. Um, than being used uh, for the projects coming out of EMT. Um, there, but there have been lots of suggestions to divert some of that money because it's a nice pot of money. Um, uh, the IECG has opposed, has opposed breaking that deal right uh, from the beginning. Um, but other states have taken it and used it as for, for just, they put it into the general fund to balance their budgets. And, and, and if that's what's going to happen with the carbon tax, then, then we, would, we would, don't think it would be an appropriate thing at all. Um, so, I don't know if Michael has some thoughts. Uh, I have a different take. I mean, I, I don't have a specific comment on that policy tool. Um, what I, my, my broader comment is that sooner or later, I think it's inevitable that there will be a cost associated with carbon everywhere that it occurs in our economy. Right now, you only pay for it in association with your electric use. But I think that to get to these kinds of targets we've been talking about this morning, eventually, somehow, there will be a cost associated with carbon. And so, for any industry, whether it's, you know, George's fleet of trucks and supermarkets, whether it's Steve's um, friends and allies who have manufacturing uh, facilities, they're, if they want to be in it for the long haul, if they want to be sustainable and competitive in a global marketplace where they eventually have to pay for the carbon associated with their consumption. These are, the, these are the days to be thinking strategically about how to reduce your exposure to that cost. And so that's, I think, a very powerful argument for doing, adopting the kinds of policies that we put up on the, on the screen here earlier this morning and the kinds of programs that we run at places like Efficiency Maine to help our, uh, our industrial and our commercial uh, consumers in Maine sort of tighten their belts in a sense and, and prepare themselves to be in a good position so that when that day comes, we're going to be lean and mean. We're going to be uh, able to be very productive, like our paper mills are, very productive um, and very competitive when their counterparts in other states that haven't taken those actions to get ready are gonna, are gonna experience a real shock. So whether it's our homeowners that are gonna have less exposure to high carbon and, and the costs associated with those fuels, or our largest industrials. Uh, I know Texas Instruments, for example, I think they have the highest energy costs of any of the facilities in the Texas Instrument family but they're so efficient with what they do in that plant in South Portland that they are one of the most competitive 
of all of the Texas Instruments plants. And that's a great story, I think, of what all of our industrials and commercial uh, customers should be thinking about. Yeah, and the one thing I just want to chime in, though, it, we've got to think about what the, how, how we're going to make sure that, that we're treating those carbon impacts at the border, too. Because if all we're going to do is, is subject um, main indu our U.S. industrials to a, car to a carbon tax, then we're not going to have effective mechanisms for preventing dumping from, from other nations that don't have similar programs, then, then all we're doing is, is uh, dis dismantling our own industrial infrastructure, which we shouldn't be doing. Great. Well, let's just give a, a round of applause to this panel, and I thank you guys very much. So we'll be taking a break now until 1 o'clock for lunch, and then at 1 p.m. we will have the Energy Working Group panel, uh, which will then be followed by the Transportation Working Group panel, which will close out our day. So thanks again for uh, the panelists. I thought that was a great discussion, and we will see everyone at 1 o'clock. So uh, looking ahead to this afternoon's panel, uh, we will now be focusing this first panel on the Energy Working Group panel, and we've assembled a great group of panelists for this event, uh, and I'd like to start with Dan to just uh, introduce himself and uh, give an overview of his background. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. I'm uh, Dan Burgess. I'm the director of the Governor's Energy Office. Uh, great to be with you. I've been in this role since 2019, and prior to that, uh, spent uh, eight years in the Energy Office in Massachusetts. I'm originally from uh, Central Maine, uh, went to the University of Maine, Orono, and I'm um, excited to be with you. I'm having coffee because I was up at five with kids and then to <laughs> drive all the way to Bar Harbor where they were uh, celebrating the uh, launch of the state's first electric school bus in, uh, at MDI High School. So pretty exciting morning and, and happy to be here with you all. Thanks for having me. Is this... Oh, it is on. Okay, cool. Awesome. Uh, Lizzie Reinhold, I'm the Vice President of Sustainability and Corporate Affairs for Summit Natural Gas of Maine. We're a, a natural gas utility company that serves Cumberland, Falmouth, Yarmouth, and the Kennebec Valley. Uh, we also are owned by Summit Utilities, who also operates Peaks Renewables, which is a biogas renewable development company here in Maine. Afternoon, everybody. Jeremy Payne. I'm the executive director of the Maine Renewable Energy Association. Uh, we're a trade group based in Augusta. And we've got uh, members who do everything from grid scale renewables to DG, distributed generation scale, and then companies that build, operate, and maintain those projects. Uh, and I've been doing this for about 13 years, and I live uh, about 10 minutes from here over in Manchester. So I appreciate the short commute, Ben. <laughs> <laughs> well, great. Well, thank you. And I, uh, you know, I appreciate all of you guys taking the time out of your very busy schedules to join us here today. And I just wanted to kick off this conversation uh, talking about the Climate Action Plan. We've heard a lot today about uh, new opportunities, job uh, creation, uh, significant capital investments that might be coming into Maine. And uh, just from each of your guys' perspective, uh, what has the Climate Action Plan and the work of the Climate Council done uh, to, to spark some investment into Maine? And, and Jeremy, I'd start off with you. Sure. Uh, I mean, I think the most important thing that the Climate Action Plan uh, has done is sent a consistent, clear message to the marketplace that Maine is open for clean energy business. Um, the, the previous administration, that was definitely in doubt at best. Um, and at worst, it was clear that that money was not welcome here. So I, I think the administration deserves tremendous credit um, for delivering that clear, consistent message. I mean, we have seen what can happen when um, when that, when that message is clear, um, that billions of dollars will flow to Maine. Um, just in the last couple of years, we've started to see tens of millions, poised to see hundreds of millions of dollars of investments in solar, uh, grid infrastructure investments. All of these things are creating real new jobs and creating real new taxable value. So I think that's, that's the kind of message that we should want to deliver to any industry, um, but particularly one when, when this administration has rightly made it a focal point um, going forward. Yeah, I'll, I'll echo that and say I think one of the greatest parts of the Climate Action Plan is that it's technology agnostic. It's really focused on renewables and reducing emissions and focused on what are the, the key technologies to get there and openly recognizes that we aren't going to do it on electricity alone, right? We also need to focus on how we're going to decarbonize the molecule. That was one of the recommendations was creating renewable fuel standard. 
um, which will drive investments in other categories, particularly in the development of green hydrogen uh, and the development of renewable natural gas. Um, at Summit, we already are investing about $20 million in developing a renewable natural gas digester down the road in Clinton, Maine. Um, and we're also looking at green hydrogen pilot projects. And we know through what's been an incredible solar boom in the development of renewables in the state, other companies are looking at developing green hydrogen as well, knowing that there's a tremendous amount of inexpensive curtailed renewable energy in Maine that could be easily turned into green hydrogen uh, and deployed for industrial purposes and, and for even heating homes eventually in the future. Yeah, and to echo both of those, the uh, Climate Action Plan came obviously during the time of great tumult of, uh, in our daily lives and society, right? And so the, the, um, the, the fortunate thing is a lot of work that the legislature did uh, with, with many folks in this room and with the governor was set Maine on the, on the path and uh, from you know an RPS of 80% by by 2030, uh, the GHG reduction uh, requirements that are in statute that I'm sure you've already heard about this morning, but the, the moment in time that those happened meant that development uh, was happening even during the pandemic. And so I'm sure you just heard Michael Stoddard talk about the number of heat pumps that were installed during a, a year of, of of you know during the pandemic. Same on the renewable side, close to a, a gigawatt of new new renewables being brought on board. Uh, or in the in the pipeline through the RPS procurements is the larger scale, then the smaller scale, uh, almost double that in the pipeline. Now, not all of those will come to fruition, but that is real significant development that uh, would not have happened if but for the the, the policies uh, enacted um, and put in place by the legislature. Climate Action Plan endorses those and says, hey, let's look, you know, sector by sector, technology by technology, and and come up with plans, whether it's offshore wind, distributed generation renewable fuel standard, uh, those types of opportunities. And so I think it helped set the pathway and stage for, uh, for what come, the, what's happening now and what can come next. I'll just say, you know, our office is focused on, we have a distributed generation working group looking at the future of distributed generation that has started to meet. We've launched an offshore wind roadmap, uh, including a, a big piece on supply chain and workforce, uh, port development, those opportunities that come along with that. And so for me, I think it's just an incredibly exciting time where the need to move forward on climate change is apparent, but the economic opportunities that come with that are just as strong, and so it's a, it's a really exciting time to, to be in the space. Right now, and just on the topic of investment, I think one of the things we could all agree on, uh, we hear a lot about, is this topic of business certainty or business uncertainty. And we've seen uh, in recent years a lot in, in Maine uh, some projects that have been delayed or stalled or ended up never coming online. And I'm just curious to, to get your guys' thoughts. As we continue to move towards a clean energy economy, how important are the signals that we're sending to investors, uh, business owners, people who are, might be looking to relocate in Maine? Because it seems like that might not be a sustainable way to help reach the goals of the Climate Action Plan. Yeah, I mean, I think generally, as you probably just heard us all say, I mean, uncertainty is the enemy of investment and development. And if we're, if, we're going to, if we're going to make Maine, or if Maine is going to be able to capitalize on what is our natural resource advantage, which is we have a lot of wide open space that we have, and if we do it right, we can site these projects, um, we've got a real opportunity to, trans, uh, to transform our economy, both locally and at the state level. And this is not just Cumberland County gets all of it, and Kennebec County gets a little bit, and Aroostook and Washington and Somerset get nothing. This is a statewide opportunity. So if we do it right, um, I think it's going to be tremendous. However, um, just a word of caution is one of the things I've seen in sort of my decade plus in this space is we're really effective at sort of opening the doors to investment. And then right as it's about to arrive, we're really good at closing the door. Um, so we saw that with land-based wind. We saw that with offshore wind. Um, and to a lesser degree, we saw even a little bit this legislative session with distributed generation. There was some concern that the policies supporting DG solar projects were too costly, so we're going to kind of clamp down on them. I understand the general concept behind that, but I think what it does is it potentially puts us in a place of defending our reputation as a state. Are we a reasonable, reliable place to deploy capital? So I think it's really important. It's not just the signals that, that this administration sends. It's the signals that our Public Utilities Commission sends that our legislature sends. If we want companies to come here, invest, and then reinvest, they need to know that this is a hospitable place for their uh, capital. Yeah, and I'd say it's also, uh, that trickles down even to municipalities. 
Uh, I don't think that there's a single energy source in the state of Maine that the state hasn't said no to at one point. Uh, whether that be a wind project, a solar project, a transmission line, or a, a natural gas pipeline, um, all of which provide tremendous benefits when it comes to reducing emissions in the state. If there's one thing that's clear about the Climate Action Plan, it's that we have to build a tremendous amount of infrastructure to be able to hit our emissions reduction goals. And we know from the Climate Council's own modeling, we're not going to get there with electricity alone. We're going to need the molecules well, which means we have two different infrastructure systems that we have to build out and then transition to a green economy and transition to being you know, carbon neutral uh, in a really short amount of time when you think about how much infrastructure and how much investment that takes over a series of decades. And yet in the state right now, it's almost impossible to build a project. Uh, we've had luck with solar recently, but I look at even one of our major fa issues facing us is how do we start decarbonizing and reducing emissions in the industrial sector? Uh, one of our largest polluters in the state, Dragon, is running on coal and rubber tires. Um, and when we tried to build a pipeline there this past year, we got turned away by one of the key towns in order to be able to do that. Um, yet, it's an instrumental piece outlined directly in the climate plan that, the, that one of the best ways to reduce emissions in the industrial sector is to expand access to natural gas. Um, so for us, if we're going to actually get there and hit our goals, we're going to have to figure out a way to get communities to say yes, to get neighbors of these projects to say yes, and get the state to create the policy and regulatory infrastructure to spur that investment and overcome a lot of these hurdles. That to me is our largest obstacle in hitting our goals. Not can we get there, not is the technology there, or will it be there in 2050, but are we actually going to be able to build it is the real question. I think I'd add that it's about certainty, so not you know, as programs or initiatives move forward, you know, not, not, not changing them without, you know, due uh, awareness to the industry so they're not investing, um, you know, when things are going to change, which we, as part of the discussion around, around solar, uh, part of the discussion around a lot of things, right, is, is what is the certainty, how can I invest? I also think it's about, um, to just to add on to what's been said, it's about uh, um, seeking innovation on, you know, if, uh, in, in a way that is, uh, going on the offense and not just saying, okay, we're open, but, you know, kind of seeking that innovation and that opportunity, because I think you're seeing other states with bigger budgets, you know, the, uh, do that. And I think there is, you know, we're not going to be able to match them on a dollar to dollar, uh, uh, come invest your, or build your innovative product here, but if we can pick our spots, pick, pick what makes sense from a, um, uh, from a main perspective and where we're poised to, to have that, you know, whether it's, it's green hydrogen or, or otherwise, there are, you can see areas where, where we're poised, um, floating offshore wind being a perfect example. We are potentially a global leader in floating offshore wind. We should embrace that, and we should do what we can to move that forward and provide that business certainty and, you know, invite companies to invest here. And, um, you know, I think if you look at the incubator spaces, the innovation spaces that are that are happening in other states, you know, there's some of that is happening here, but there's an opportunity to do more of that. And I'm so excited about that. Yeah. <coughs> um, one, one of the things I wanted to turn to, uh, and it's, it's something I've certainly heard, and I think Jeremy and Lizzie and I were talking about this during lunch, but is sort of this sight and regulation issues that may exist in Maine. And I'm sure each of you can probably speak in more depth about some of the issues and, that you've, you've run into along the way, but what role does Maine play in mitigating site issues, and what does that look like? How can we get some of these projects to come online faster to help reach the goals of the Climate Action Plan? How, how do we navigate the waters to get through that? I'll go first. So, I mean, I think sure. it's about uh, uh, taking, um, well, at the state, you know, obviously there's local control, right? So the state is never going to uh, come in when it comes to a solar setting, for example, and say, you must do it this way. Um, that, that just doesn't work. And I think that, you know, the opportunity is, is uh, as Jeremy and I were talking about before, is to provide guidance and to provide, you know, uh, uh, model ordinances and to look at kind of what the best practices are. I will say the industry came together with some of the environmental communities and, and did that this last time around and I think that's helped town by town figure out, okay, how should we approach this potential this potential development. You know, I think there's, we're, uh, uh, my office along with the uh, DACF is, is um, working on a agricultural siting uh, working group right now to look at how do we want to treat those uh, or, or ensure that, you know, if these investments are happening on agricultural land, that we're doing, doing so in a thoughtful way. Um, I grew up on a farm, and I think, you know, I think it's exciting to think about uh, farms getting another source of revenue, but there's only so much farmland in Maine, right? And so we have to think about what the best, best balance of that um, is. And so I think it's a, 
from a state perspective, um, you know, providing best practices, providing um, guidance where we can. I, you know, I'm not sure if it was mentioned this morning, but uh, in the last budget, the governor put forward a, a $5 million for municipal partnership funding to really look at how can we provide technical assistance to these communities, not just on siting, but on uh, um, uh, climate um, infrastructure opportunities, um, looking at um, mitigation and adaptation. How can, we, how can we better partner with municipalities? I think it's a huge opportunity. Yeah, it's a really difficult question. I think if we had a, a clear answer for it, we probably would have solved it by now, uh, given the struggles we face. But I'll say, you know, I, I do think one of the largest issues facing us is, is that municipality perspective. And perhaps part of that is not necessarily having a clear roadmap or vision of, okay, this is the direction we're going and these are the projects that are gonna come online when, and, and we're never gonna be able to have that. Um, but I do think that there, you know, it's a scary concept for a company looking to come and invest tens of millions or hundreds of millions of dollars in a state when you can see that your project could potentially end up on a referendum and cost you even more. Um, and, and you know, I'm not saying, you know, we don't really have a, a bone to, like a, a side to take on, on the NECAC referendum or what's happening right now with potentially public public power uh, and a referendum around that necessarily other than we're an investor-owned utility uh, at Summit. But I will say that just the sheer precedent it's setting from an investment standpoint um, and the sheer precedent setting both from an activist level of being someone in a community saying, oh, okay, so I don't want this project in my backyard. I, you know, I, I can take advantage of the momentum against development and maybe potentially bring another project to referendum. And the precedent setting for businesses saying, is that really a state I want to go wanting to invest this much money if it's going to cost me so much more and create so much more uncertainty about being able to get it built? Um, I'll tell you, I, I would be lying if I didn't say that factored into our decision just not to go to the mid-coast. Uh, because if we were going to have to invest hundreds of millions of dollars in a referendum to get a pipeline built, um, it, it wasn't going to make the project. It, it wasn't going to make sense for us. Um, so that's hard because, as I said before, we're not going to be able to, to get to a, you know, our emissions reduction goals without building significant amounts of infrastructure. And I, I don't know how we get beyond it other than particularly courage as well from our political leaders. And I mean, I think we've seen the governor being willing to take a really tough, tough stance on NECAC at a time where it maybe wasn't as politically expedient. Um, but we're going to have to see that more and more, I believe, as we continue to see municipalities taking the step of, it's not the state standing away, it's not even permitting, it's, it's sort of the local control issue, which, I, look, I grew up in Maine, I grew up in a small town, I grew up with a father who showed up at every town meeting to make sure our, our, our road didn't get paved. So I understand the issue of wanting to protect your own. Um, but at the same time, like there's a sacrifice in climate change we're all going to have to make and we're going to have to create literally a new future for ourselves for how we get energy. And, um, and that's going to take, that's going to take all of us thinking about what that actually looks like and what that means for what our landscape looks like as a state. Yeah, I agree with everything that Dan and Lizzie just said. The one thing I would add is I think what we have done poorly as a state as it relates to energy in particular is articulate what's in it for me. Mm -hmm. So when we're starting to talk about projects coming into a community, whether it's solar, whether it's wind, whether it's gas, whether it's infrastructure, all of it, we haven't done a very good job of saying to the average person whose community you might be impacting, say, all right, well, what, what do I get from this? So I think part of that conversation needs to grow from every type of developer needs to come in. You know, maybe it's consideration of community benefits packages. I think what Dan said regarding model ordinances is, is, is right, because that gives some comfort. Um, to the community that they're not just going to be overrun by development. I think what we've already seen just in the last few months, I think you know, two years ago if you would have said to me, oh, there's going to be a whole bunch of communities that are going to pass or some communities that are going to pass moratoria around solar development, I would have said you're crazy. Um, but I think because there's been a lot of solar, people think, oh, God, if we allow it to come in, they're going to be able to put this anywhere and everywhere. We better slow them down. So if the state or through partnerships between industry and environmental groups provide a toolkit of options, here are some things that you as a host community could yeah. or should consider, that might, that might create some of that comfort for the community to say, okay, this is not going to change the fabric of my community. I'm going to recognize the place where I grew up, where I'm trying to raise my family. I think that's the kind of thing that we need to think about is giving people, these host communities, the tools to get comfortable with this new development, this new investment. 
And, and on that note, Jeremy, um, what, what does success look like in Maine and how do we define our energy future? I mean, we've certainly talked a lot uh, in the first part of this panel about uh, investment and, and job creation, but what, what is, as a whole, what does success look like? Is it just new investment creating jobs? Is it uh, lowering the cost of energy for the ratepayers? Uh, is it, you know, lowering the amount of greenhouse gas emissions? Is it a little bit of all of the above? Like, what, how, how, we certainly hear a lot about the goals of the Climate Action Plan and the Climate Council working very hard to reach these goals, but what does the success in the long run look like? For me, I think it's all of those things, but that kind of goes back to the point I was just trying to make. I think it's going to be different for every person that you ask. So if you ask 100, if we asked everybody around this room, what's, what's, what, what is the measure of success that matters most to you, we're probably going to get different answers. So I think we need to be able to be creative and make sure that the message we're delivering is the right message to that audience. Um, so at the end of the day, most people are going to want to hear, is this going to be cheaper for me or not? Um, that tends, you know, the. The, the checkbook, the wallet policy tends to be the one that people vote with with their feet at, uh, at the booths. So if that's something that we can convey to people clearly and succinctly, hey, this is going to be cheaper for you over the long run in the following ways and for the following reasons and do it credibly, I think that's success. Yeah, I look at energy policy through two different lenses. It's an economic lens and environmental lens. And the nexus between the two of them is where good policy meets. I think for us, what success looks like is but A, I mean, at the end of the day, there's going to be a cost to climate change. We, we're already seeing it. We're already seeing it in a lot of different ways, including, including in energy costs. Um, I think we have to be looking at what's the least, least cost way of getting there and, and, and perhaps the most expeditious way of getting there. You look to Europe. They've looked at a lot of different methods. They're far beyond us when it comes to hitting their emissions reduction goals. They've done a lot more studies than us. You know, they've looked at all electric pathways. They've looked at a combination of green, you know, green hydrogen, RNG, and and renewable uh, electrons. Um, they've ultimately come to a conclusion of, okay, we need an all of the above energy solution. It's going to be trillions of dollars less expensive to pursue a solution where we have green hydrogen and RNG as our molecule, and then renewable energy as our our electron as we meet energy needs. Um, I think, I think for us, it's. It's helping educate people about what other costs that that initial cost and energy cost is going to offset, right? From the perspective of of damage uh, and and other issues that we're facing. Um, but I also think a short term win, like we can look at, yeah, long term. Obviously, it's hitting our emissions reduction goals and not breaking people's banks. But a short term win is just building the the actual regulatory and policy framework to enable that transition, which. We've come a long way when it comes to, I'd say, the electric grid. We have our RPS. We haven't really touched when it comes to, you know, our pipeline system and our, our, our fuels. Um, I think that's the next step with a renewable fuel standard. Um, but short term, we're not going to get anywhere unless we have a policy and regulatory framework to enable that and to create some sort of parameters around development and investment and how, how you recover those costs from a ratepayer perspective or a customer perspective. Um, that's short term. Um, and then long term, I think we need to have some really clear analysis about what the true cost of, of decarbonizing is for us as a state. I think we've seen a lot of goals put out there, but we haven't necessarily seen realistic numbers. We've seen national numbers, I think, from, from studies uh, across the United States and across um, Europe, and then some that look at a, a world perspective. But, you know, Maine is unique, every state is unique, and it's going to take a different different sort of scenario to, to get there. And I just don't think we've, we've really hit that as much so that we can understand and prepare folks for, for what it is we're trying to do and make sure that the strategy we're deploying is the most cost-effective strategy. I think I would uh, think about it as being uh, a, a, all of the above in, in many ways. But for me, it comes down to being clean, affordable, and dependable. So clean, we've, we've talk, spent a lot of time talking about the, uh, uh, our energy future and what the success looks like. I think the affordability is, is really key, ensuring that we're getting towards that future in, in a way which um, is, is affordable. Uh, and then dependable, is it, or is, or is it resilient? Is it reliable? Can we count on it? And I think all of those will support a way in which we can grow our economy, and not just in the energy sector, but kind of uh, across the board for the state. Um, and so I think when I think about what success looks like, it fits within those, within those buckets. And I think that the Climate Action Plan has set us up, uh, along with the other efforts, to begin marching down that pathway. 
Now, I want to circle back to something uh, you mentioned earlier, Dan, and uh, you talked about how we have the ability to be a global leader in offshore wind. And uh, I, I was just looking, hoping you could provide us with a couple minute update on where Maine stands right now as we shift towards uh, this offshore wind market. I know, uh, I think it was last week, uh, the application was submitted to the feds for the, um, the floating research array. Uh, there's obviously the UMaine project out there, but if you could just take a couple minutes and, and update us on where we stand as a state in terms of the shift to offshore wind, I think that'd be great. Yeah, happy to. So uh, Maine is, uh, again, poised to be a real leader in the floating offshore wind space. We have are uh, looking at it in a few different ways. So one is the, um, uh, the kind of overall Maine offshore wind initiative, which we're kind of, uh, our, uh, encapsulates everything that, that we're doing. So we're uh, putting out, uh, supported by the EDA, a two-year offshore wind roadmap, which I talked about a little bit which includes uh, an energy working group, a uh, environmental fisheries working group, supply chain and workforce working group that is looking at, okay, what are the recommendations <laughs> we need to do to, to move Maine forward? The uh, uh, UMaine has been uh, leaders in this for a decade, as we've, we've talked about a little bit. They are, they have a long-term contract and are poised for the one turbine demonstration project that's off the coast of uh, Monhegan Island. And then uh, after about 10 months of uh, uh, public stakeholder engagement, research and analysis. The state has put forward a uh, research application to the federal government for a floating offshore wind uh, demonstration site or, or research array. So that's 12 turbines or fewer uh, in 15.2 square miles off the coast of Maine. Could be interconnected to uh, likely Wiscasset or Yarmouth. Um, and so we've put forward that application. The federal government, the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management will um, consider that take public comment, and then um, either move forward uh, with the lease, uh, which we're, we're hopeful for. I will say that uh, this past legislative session, a uh, bipartisan uh, uh, a group of legislators did a couple of things. They created a research consortium to look at, okay, if we're gonna do this research site, how is the research being managed? And so it's gonna be a public-private partnership that manages the research at, at the site or suggests research. And then they endorsed uh, and, and passed LD336, which uh, is the power purchase agreement for that research array. So a pretty clear indication, strong support from a bipartisan group of the legislature that offshore wind is a, is a big opportunity for the state. Yeah, and one thing I just wanted to add is just sort of kudos for the administration. I, mean, I think I probably gave this quote to somebody uh, in the press. Uh, you know, I, most of us in this room have probably been hearing about the quote unquote promise of offshore wind in Maine for 15 years. Um, I've seen more action in the last two years than I have the last 10 combined. So the fact that there were actually, the ball is moving down the field, we have, we have some visibility into what the future could look like, but also still doing a lot of work on the other side to make sure that we get the siting right. I mean, there's not going to be an outcome here where absolutely everybody is going to be happy, but I think there's going to be an outcome that is going to be workable for everyone. Yeah, I mean, I, just, there are seven turbines in the water in, in the U.S. right now, right? So seven, two in, two in Virginia, five in, five in Rhode Island which if you get the chance to go to is well worth the, the boat ride. I um, got a little bit seasick, but that's for <laughs> another time, even though it's like very close to shore. But uh, anyway, it is just, a, it, if you look at uh, the Biden administration's uh, 30,000 megawatts by 2030 target, where we are now, it is a huge opportunity for growth. You're seeing the states below us and even on the West Coast to move forward with our purchase agreement, port infrastructure investments. And I think Maine is, is, is poised to, to be in that space, but also to lead on the floating floating offshore wind because most of those states are just doing fixed bottom and floating offers a, a tremendous opportunity. I want to, do you have anything to add, Lizzie? Did I cut no, you off? No, I was just leaning forward <laughs> so I could see you. Uh, I want to shift forward now to a uh, bill that was passed this past legislative session, LD 1710. Uh, the Senate president's legislation from last session has been described as one of if not the most significant energy policies passed since the deregulation of our energy markets in the late 1990s. What might this mean for residential ratepayers and for commercial and industrial consumers? What type of investment does this mean specifically for Arusta County and the rest of the state? I know this is something Jeremy, you and I have spoken about. What are your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's right, Ben. I mean, if, if we do it right and we can do it cost effectively, it is economically and environmentally transformative. I mean, the, there's, it's long been understood that the, the cheapest land-based wind in New England resides in Arusta County. Um, the challenge has always been, well, how do you get it out? Um, because there's just not enough load in Arusta County to justify the expense of developing the project. 
And so the challenge has been, I think the legislature has been always willing to sort of talk about, <coughs> excuse me, some of the opportunities to develop and, and contract for the generation, but they've never really been interested in talking about the infrastructure you need to deliver it to market. That's what this bill, LD1710, does. It really marries up that policy conversation to make sure you're doing both. So I think in terms of what it, does it do for residential, commercial, industrial consumers, if it's cost effective, uh, I, I think it is transformative. I mean, you're, gonna, you're potentially talking about thousands of megawatts that you inject into Maine that we can then export. And, and some people immediately say, well, why don't we just keep it all here? You know, why wouldn't we just make sure that all of the megawatt hours are consumed in Maine for Mainers by Mainers? And my answer would be, is that what we do with potatoes, blueberries, lobsters, or microbrews? <laughs> um, no, we don't. When you are awash in something that people have demand for, you export it, and you typically import things that you are in need of. We happen to have a natural resource advantage where we can develop a lot of this potentially cost effectively. So yes, we should make sure that Maine is being taken care of and our consumers are getting a good deal, but it shouldn't be, that shouldn't end at the New Hampshire border. If there's an opportunity to export that to other southern New England states, which also have large renewable targets and greenhouse gas reduction goals, then we should do that as well. Uh, so, I mean, I think uh, adding on to that, the, uh, our, we did a study about how we're going to meet our 80% by 2030, did some scenario analysis looking at specific, you know, pathways in order to do that and kind of what needs to happen. And that showed, but we were all set until about 2025, 2026 uh, with our current policies, but we needed to move forward other policies to meet the 2030 uh, 80% RPS number uh, to the tune of about 800 to 900 megawatts of new clean energy generation. And so this piece of legislation will, will support that, right? This solves the, or begins to try to get at the chicken and the egg of transmission versus generation. How do you, how do, you do those two together in a way that's cost effective? And so, you know, we're following the proceeding at, at, uh, at the PUC really closely, excited to see what comes out of it. Uh, you know, I think there are off ramps if, there, if the cost effective question uh, comes, into, comes into play, the PUC has the authority to, to do that. Um, I, I will say the other interesting thing about that that's different than previous pieces of you know, procurement legislation is it talks about the need to look at um, electrification and the, uh, um, you know, how the system will look, how the needs look. So if it's uh, modeling kind of uh, looking at when, how many, we're going to be adding so many cars, one of those cars is going to be charged, then it's not just a, there must be electricity generation, but the, the temporal nature of it and the timing of it, which I think is pretty innovative and watching what happens at the PUC, PUC closely. And one last thing I, I wanted to ask before we, we open it up to a more of an open dialogue and any uh, questions from the, from the audience, because I, I think there is certainly so much happening in the energy utility world. Uh, I think it's important that we have a, enough time for an open dialogue. Um, but my last question to you guys, and I'd love to hear from each of you on this, is you know, how are we doing? I mean, I think one of the things I think we can all agree upon is if we are to combat and fight climate change. There's a certain amount of, has to happen nationally, happen, ha has to happen globally. And we certainly have taken an aggressive approach here in Maine. But my question to you guys would be is, I know you have colleagues that you might speak with in, in other states, um, whether it's New England, nationally, but really just a, a high level overview of, of how we are doing uh, compared to the rest of the country. Because I do think, as I was planning this energy summit, one of the things that kept popping into my head is, you know, this is great what Maine is doing. We are taking a national, global leadership role on this. But there's still another side of the story that I think needs to be told. So I don't know if you want to kick us off with that, Lizzie. Sure. Um, so I actually, I, I op work in five different states, Maine, Missouri, Arkansas, Oklahoma, and Colorado, and deal with energy policy in all those states. I think in some ways Maine is really pushing the envelope. Obviously, we've done a lot when it comes to renewable electricity development, solar, wind. I think where, where we're, we're struggling is creating a policy and regulatory framework on the other side of the equation, which is how we also decarbonize the fuels that we use in our energy system. We know from our own modeling, we can't get there with just electricity. We still are going to need the molecule in some form. And other states have really led the way in creating renewable fuel standards in creating a cottage industry around green hydrogen, or even doing more investment in just research in green hydrogen. And when I say other states, it's not just blue states, it's not just red states. You know, Oregon is a great example. They have a, uh, a standard in place that sets mandates for uh, natural gas utilities to bring renewable natural gas onto their systems. 
um, and they have a price cap for how it impacts rates so that it can be done in a prudent manner. Um, so similar to an RPS, but for a, a gas system, it's based on, on volume rather than emissions reduction because I think as a country we're still trying to figure out how to account for the emission savings of renewable gas considering it's the only uh, carbon negative fuel source in the entire world. Um, but in other states, you look at Oklahoma, they passed legislation to study the creation of a renewable fuel standard in their state and they've also created a hydrogen task force that is led by their energy secretary to really dig into how can we how can we capitalize off what is going to be a hydrogen boom in this country both from a green hydrogen perspective and a blue hydrogen perspective um, in Missouri last year they passed renewable and uh, renewable fuel standard legislation that creates a voluntary program for natural gas utilities to bring carbon neutral and carbon negative fuels onto their system and begin decarbonizing their system. So in states across the country we're seeing a lot of movement, Nevada is similar in that, in that side of the equation and I think for us just as we've created a policy framework to decarbonize the electron it's essential we do that on the molecular side and we're running out of time to be able to be in the lead when it comes to attract that investment in renewable natural gas development and hydrogen development. I think we just heard uh, about the transmission line in northern Maine. We heard about offshore wind and in all of those scenarios we have a tremendous amount of curtailed renewable energy in this state. Energy that's just going to waste every year and energy that's also impacting ratepayers from an electric perspective. We saw in 2020 Versant uh, filed paperwork in the first six days of Weaver Wind being on uh, online. I think they had over $200,000 in spent costs of just curtailed energy. That energy can be used to power an electrolyzer and generate, and generate green molecules in the form of green hydrogen. We have tons of opportunity to be piloting that technology in the state of Maine, but haven't been able to pass legislation in the state yet to be able to jumpstart that investment. Uh, we're excited at Summit. We did just get a $5 million grant from DOE to do a demonstration project at our renewable natural gas facility and have the first on-system uh, green hydrogen project where that hydrogen will be methanized and turned into biogas to, to go to homes. Um, but again, it's a demonstration project, about 18 months. Meanwhile, New York attracted over $100 million in investment in green hydrogen. Um, and California just put $110 million of taxpayer dollars into green hydrogen development. So I think there are ways that we can lead and we are uniquely positioned to be the leader in these technologies. We just have to create the policy framework the same way we have to attract the same investments that we have in solar, that we have in wind. Um, and it could be extremely powerful for us and also be, be the ability for us to hit our emissions reduction goals. Um. I'll just give one anecdotal piece, which is in the last two years, uh, not that this is something that's super meaningful to everybody here, but it is to me and us, and I think it, it reflects what we've seen, which is our membership has doubled in the last two years. <clears throat> so that's companies looking to Maine as potentially hospitable place to deploy their capital. Uh, we used to have about 30, 40, 50 members at most. Now we're pushing close to 100. I mean, that is a massive shift, and that is entirely because of policies like Maine won't wait, the efforts of the Climate Council and the fact that it's sending a clear signal to the marketplace that Maine is moving in this direction and it's not likely to back away from it. But w what that demonstrates to me is we have gotten investors' attention, um, but what it also makes clear to me is we need to make sure that we don't stand in our own way, that we can make some of this investment that we're talking about a reality, but that there's still a lot of work to do to convince people <clears throat> that it's in our state's best interest, that it's in their own individual household's best interest. Um, but one other thing I also should have mentioned in the previous subject, and, and Lizzie just touched upon it, which reminded me of it, when we're, when we're talking about developing infrastructure or bringing new projects online, we've got to do it in a way that's responsible. We can't just inject a whole bunch of new megawatts in a system and make the constraints that we, that we already have worse. We need to make sure that we are designing infrastructure that can support existing projects and also make room for new projects. So, I mean, I think there's a lot of ways to answer that. I mean, I, my next uh, thing that I have the rest of the week is the National Association of State Energy Officials meeting, uh, annual meeting, you know, it's actually in Portland this year. They've, uh, to my awareness, never hosted this in Maine. They're excited about coming to Maine, uh, hopefully, I mean, probably because of the October weather, but also because <laughs> of the, the progress that we're making on these topics. Um, so, I, you know, I think uh, states look to each other to, to, to see what's worked, to push the envelope, to have those conversations and um, so I think I think we're doing well I think uh, this is a transformational time in our energy system and our energy sector 
uh, if you look at what's happening in, the, um, in coordination of the buildings and transportation in the built environment and the transportation sector I mean this is a really um, it's a moment in time uh, that we are living through and I think it's exciting to think about the the possibilities that, that come with that. And I'd like to think Maine can be on the forefront of doing that the right the right way. Um, I shouldn't you know, leave without saying it's exciting to see what's happening or could be happening down in DC, the, you know, the, the opportunity for the uh, infrastructure funding to come through or, or other funding could really be transformational for, for the state and would touch all of the topics that are, that are being addressed today. So you know, electric vehicle, uh, charging infrastructure to uh, money in the, the DOE transmission uh, office and money to the states to do more of this work. I think it's a it's an exciting time. So I think we're doing well and we're poised to do better. Great, thank you. Well, I'd like to now open it up uh, for some question and answers. We have about 15 minutes until our next panel. Uh, Angie is going to be taking over my job from earlier. So uh, if anyone has a question, please just raise your hand. And we'll make sure to get the uh, the microphone to you. So we heard about um, the connection between biofuel and the forestry industry earlier. Um, Lizzie, can you tell us a little bit more about your biogas initiative where you are working with farmers to turn manure into uh, um, biogas? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so renewable natural gas or is gas formed from, from organic materials. So you can, you can get it from a landfill, you can get it from food waste, um, but really the more, more powerful and really, I'd say, I guess, lucrative in the sense of emissions reduction comes from, from animal waste. So either from dairy digestion or hog digestion actually is incredibly powerful. We all know that agriculture generates a ton of methane every single year. And right now we have that methane being uh, really channeled into, the waste is channeled into lagoons and you have the meth waste being generated. Well, you can collect that waste, separate the methane gas from, from the, the solid, if you will, of, of the manure and actually generate pipeline quality gas used to heat homes and, and fuel industry. Um, that gas is actually one of the only carbon or is the only carbon negative fuel source because you're taking more methane out of the air than what you're putting back in when you burn it at the burner tip when you think about methane being uh, so much more potent than CO2. Um, so for us, we're actually partnering with Flood Brothers Farm and another, uh, a number of other farmers to generate uh, renewable natural gas on site in Clinton, Maine. It'll be uh, a unique RNG project because across the country, you've seen renewable natural gas developed at large, large agricultural facilities. So ones that have a huge mass that so you can take the manure and, and do it all on site. For us, we're actually partnering with a number of different farms, trucking the manure to the site. We'll generate about 125,000 MMBTU of gas a year, and it will be the equivalent of taking about 6,800 cars off the road from an emission savings perspective. Um, with that project, it's great because it helps clean up the farm. It also generates a renewable gas. Uh, on top of that, it also helps reduce costs for farmers um, because we we get, yes, a gas. You also get a solid and a liquid. You get a solid that can be used for animal bedding, and you get a liquid that can be used for fertilizer so you no longer have to spread the manure on the farm, which can help with, help with runoff um, and also clean up other aspects um, from a, a nitrates perspective. So it's a really cool partnership and a really incredible opportunity. And to me, it's a really main opportunity from the sense of being resourceful because you're you literally taking one man's trash, if you will, and turning it into another man's treasure to be able to heat their home for the winter. Um, you can do this also with landfill gas, and you can cap landfills. There's a tremendous amount of opportunity in Maine, and you can also use food waste. I think uh, recent studies have shown that they actually think that we could be generating, we have enough feedstock, is what they call it, to generate up to 7 trillion BTU of, of renewable natural gas a year in Maine. That doesn't take into consideration hydrogen development. Um, on site at our RNG project, we're actually going to be using renewable energy to power an electrolyzer. The electrolyzer separates hydrogen from oxygen atoms and actually creates green hydrogen. Um, we're going to then capture the carbon from the renewable natural gas digester and mix it with the hydrogen uh, and put it into a methanizer. That's what the DOE grant was for. And that actually creates pipeline quality methane that we'll also be putting in the system. So again, a green renewable form of a gas that can be used to heat homes uh, and, and power industry. Pretty cool. 
I won't get into, into how you methanize the gas, but if you want to know, it's also a pretty cool story, but a little nerdy. So. about whether it could be done on, on a, a small scale. I mean, you're talking about right. a number of farms working together in that one. So yeah. from a cost perspective, generally it's done at a, at a really big production facility. That's why you see sort of Wyoming, you see Arkansas, you see Missouri investing in RNG because they have these bigger facilities. We're bringing together the farms to bring it up to scale to make it more cost effective. Um, but right now, the interesting thing is renewable natural gas and, and hydrogen don't qualify for PTC and ITC tax credits the way solar and wind do, despite the fact that they're renewable. If we can get the federal government to include this type of technology in the ITC and PTC tax credit from an investment and production perspective, we can bring down the cost to make it more deployable um, for smaller scale like you're talking about. And our hope is that will happen. Uh, there's an effort afoot at the federal level um, to, to include tax credits for, for RNG and, and hydrogen the same way you would for wind and solar with the hope that as the technology matures, you're allowed to bring down that cost and, and use smaller scale, de scale deployment so that we can really capitalize it in, uh, on it in Maine. Um, it, would make it, it would make it a lot, a lot better to just have it on site at every farm. Thank you. I'll try one that's just kind of a discussion start starter. <clears throat> I think the effective date of legislation that passed in the first session is actually uh, next week. It's either the 18th or the 19th. But is there anything you're tracking in the second session that's especially aligned with your goals that you want to try to push through? Yeah, I mean, I, I would say that uh, uh, a lot, thanks for the question, Marty. A, a lot of, uh, at least the work that um, it's hard to believe it's only been a couple months, right, since the session uh, uh, came to a close. But we, we've, we spent all, we were directed to do quite a bit in the last session. So we're, again, we're doing a distributed generation working group that's tasked with coming up with the future of Maine solar policy. We have uh, uh, an offshore wind consortium to stand up that we need to move forward. We have um, uh, an energy storage study. We haven't talked a lot about energy storage today, but we have, you know, new goals put in place uh, or, tar or targets for for energy storage in Maine, 300 megawatts by 2025, and then 400 by 2030, uh, which is actually may not sound like a lot when you're looking at other states, but in you know when you look at it uh, and with regards to how big our load is, they're pretty significant targets. And so we have a, an RFP on the street right now to hire a consultant to do a, a market assessment for for energy storage. We're doing a clean transportation roadmap, which I know Marty, you're you're taking part in as well to look at, you know, how do we get to not to steal the next panels. Thunder, I know transportation is next, but looking at how do we how do we achieve those those big numbers in the climate action plan, and then I think uh, you you heard a lot from EMT and others before, looking at commercial pace that they have to move forward, the, the the accelerator, and that's not to mention all the work at the PUC. So a lot of work had done this last session uh, uh, over Zoom and otherwise, and so looking forward, I think it's about um, you know where we uh, might have opportunities where we're not moving forward. Uh, you know, I think kind of long-term planning, uh, those type of items I think are, are on the list. I know that the committee carried over a number of bills that we're looking through, but turn it over to others. Yeah, I, for us, I think we're just looking at the results of some of the legislation that did pass. Um, we're particularly interested and included in the storage bill is also a study on, on hydrogen pilots, uh, which, is, which is gonna be interesting to see how that comes out. Uh, we're also really just interested in seeing how the legislation plays out regarding the PUC and adding to their charge that in addition to looking at sort of prudency and cost effectiveness, you look at the environmental impact. Um, for us, that's certainly something that's, that's interesting because we've been looking for ways to bring renewable fuels onto our system. But of course, there's always that prudency question from a cost perspective, even if it increases the cost by two cents uh, per MCF, right? It's, it's imprudent, we can't make that investment. Um, now the question is whether whether there is a threshold where you can make an emissions reduction argument um, and, and begin to decarbonize your fuel sources, which which in turn from a resiliency perspective is really great because if we're generating homegrown renewable gases in Maine, it'll create resiliency by increasing gas supply and making us less susceptible to price spikes uh, from out-of-state production, which, which we see quite often. 
Um, so that's, that's what we're watching play out and just looking as new bills get, get submitted. I'll just add quickly, Dan and <coughs> Lizzie covered the legislative piece and Dan touched upon the PUC, but Marty, I think that's the thing I'm really focused on is what happens over at the Public Utilities Commission here in the next six to 18 months. Um, they've got a bunch of dockets open. Some are open related to how, when, and whether and the costs associated with interconnecting new projects. Um, and then probably the, the biggest topic that we may not have discussed here today is grid modernization. Um, that to me feels like the, the phrase energy independence from five years ago. I don't think anybody actually has any idea what it really means, or at least we don't have a shared definition of what grid modernization means. It just sounds great. It's like, right, we want a modern grid, right? Okay, at, at what cost? And to whom? And when? And what do we get for it? You know, those are, those are going to be some of the questions that the PUC is going to be grappling with. And I, I think that's, to me, that's the transformative conversation that's going to take place over at the PUC in the next year or two is, is grid modernization. And what does it look like? Is the panel concerned about this winter, been reading about in Europe, they're looking at skyrocketing prices, are we looking at anything similar um, in Maine this winter with global prices of not only oil but potentially natural gas, and if natural gas is our lead for electricity, that potentially also affects electric prices as well. Yeah, I mean, just say it's something we're watching re really closely. I um, mean, I think if you look at the, um, you know, uh, we we're just talking about the four of the panel, kind of the, the trends that you're seeing in, in gas and, and, and particularly oil um, and, and what the impacts to main people will be, residents and businesses, and something we're watching closely. Um, at, to your point, you know, are the, the natural gas is a, you know important part of the electricity supply, and that will, you know, if the prices go up there, then you'll see prices increase on the electric system too. The, the uh, standard offer is, is out right now, and so we don't have that number for the next year, but something we're watching really closely. Yeah, I talked to the governor's office two times last week about it. Obviously, as, as a gas utility, we're always looking at getting the best price we can for our customers. It's a direct pass through to our customers. We, we don't make any money off of it. And we just we just set our, our winter rate. Um, it was set, uh, went into effect October 1st. Um, Customers will be paying a higher rate than they did the last two winters, but a lower rate than they did in 2018, believe it or not. Um, we also hedge, so we pre-buy a, a large portion of our gas and lock in at a rate so that we aren't susceptible to those mid-winter price spikes that we often see, and so we can keep a predictable environment for our customers. Um, that I would say, you know, 60% of homes are heated with oil in Maine, a much smaller amount are heated with natural gas, but we all rely on that gas from an electric perspective. And electric utilities are often by, you know, that gas is based on a spot market, so far more susceptible to those price spikes. Um, from a consumer perspective, I'll say I locked in on my oil last week. I was just telling Jeremy this, and I'm paying $700 more for the same amount of gas as I did last year. Um, that's a lot of money for a lot of consumers. It's pretty crazy. I live in Rangeley, it gets really cold, so, um, we buy a lot of oil, uh, but but it's still a really high number. And uh, for us, I actually spent my morning working on a plan for how we're going to enhance and make far more robust our conservation messaging, our energy efficiency messaging, and our payment assistant messaging uh, for customers throughout the entire winter. Because um, you know, oftentimes you don't think about that cost until all of a sudden you get your bill one month. So for us, we're trying to make sure we openly communicate with customers about the increased costs so that they can be conscious of it and be thinking of how do we reduce it. The other issue I was talking to Dan about is that we're actually coming off of the pandemic where customers were, you know, disconnects were suspended. And because disconnects were suspended, we had customers who went an entire year without paying any of their natural gas bills. And I know other utility companies are, are seeing that. And so now there's been an effort to get everybody on payment plans so that we're not disconnecting folks, but you have this huge amount of folks with debt to their utilities as they head into a winter where there are gonna be higher energy costs. So how can we leverage federal dollars and state dollars to maybe pay down those debts? Some states have taken really unique uh, positions and changed how they work LIHEAP, and I think there are opportunities for us to do the same in Maine, but for us, we're looking at how do we educate our customers about those opportunities. Um, because that's just a, it's just a situation you never want your customers to be in. Thank you. Um, 
Some of you have talked a little bit about subsidies. And we know one of the biggest subsidies is uh, for oil. Uh, that the oil, oil and, and gas companies, for that matter, have had subsidies, kind of tax subsidies, for the longest while. Uh, have any of you thought about what would happen and how it would affect what you're up to getting to the renewables? Uh, uh, by the way, that <clears throat> some <clears throat> you mentioned, Liz, that your your natural gas, sorry, your um, Renewable uh, the biogas, yeah. yes, was not, uh, uh, did not have a subsidy. Right. So what, what would you all see if all of those subsidies just went away? It's a great question. I mean, it, it, it's a conversation that takes place just about every legislative session, which is people who like certain types of energy say, well, you wouldn't be able to survive or don't like certain types of energy, well, you wouldn't be able to survive without subsidies, and other people who don't like other types say, well, you have them built in. I mean, I think at the end of the day, if we strip away all the subsidies and incentives that exist, I think just about any type of renewable, with limited exception, can compete um, with anything else. But do I think it's worth our time sort of debating federal incentives that have been built into the tax code for 40, 50, 60 years? Honestly, at this point, I don't. Um, they are, they're there. Um, I think trying to unwind that clock is probably not worth our time. To me, it's like when anybody says, oh, well, we're going to go ahead and we're going to reform ISO New England. Have at it. I'll be over here doing something else that's actually going to change an outcome. Um, and that's not, that's not to attack your client, Bill. It's just in, in my 13 years, everybody says that. And then there's the New England governors and Eastern Canadian premier statement that comes out annually that says that we're going to do all the things with these words and then we do the same thing, we don't do any of those things, and then we issue the same words a year later. What's the point? Um, to me, I'd rather actually try and achieve something rather than arguing about something. Whether I agree with it or disagree with it, I just don't think it's gonna change at the federal level. That's why I think what, what the governor has done here is laudable. She's saying, look, there's a lot of noise over here. We're not gonna pay attention to that noise. We're gonna focus on what we can control inside these borders. Yeah. Did you have your hand up to him or no? <laughs> I, couldn't, I couldn't tell if it was a hand or not. He was, he was applauding in the back. Yeah. <laughs> I walked into that. So who wants to reform myself? <laughs> Everybody. Um, and they all want to reform it in their, other way, in their own way. Um, no, but you touched on something earlier about how we view energy in Maine for export versus our own use. And, um, and, the, and before that you said, well, we have to make sure we explain to people what's in it for them. Um, one of the things that I've been seeing, you know, I, I agree with that, but it's sort of let's make a deal mentality. And how do you see that playing out? If, if we're building things that are going to be for export in Maine, um, you know, what are the deals gonna have to look like to do that? Is it pushing that sort of mentality of deal making versus this is a good thing for the region, we should be hosting it and not trying to extort a whole bunch of things out of it for ourselves? It's a great question, Phil. Um, I mean, the short answer is the one thing I know for sure that we shouldn't do is have our elected officials in Augusta telling communities what they need and what they want. Um, I think what we need to make sure that we're doing as, as an industry broadly is going into the communities and finding out what is most impactful to them. Some communities might want broadband, some communities might want property tax reductions, some communities might need a new fire truck, they might want to hire a new police officer. It's going to depend. Uh, it's not a one-size-fits-all approach where here's a check for $10,000 and now that box has been checked and we can come in. It's going to be different everywhere. So I think we need to go in you know, with, our, with our eyes open, our ears open, being willing to listen. Um, that doesn't mean it's a blank check for every community in Maine to say, we'll take it. Um, there is a give and take. There's only so much meat on the bone that a developer can offer to a community. But I would say, I think going forward, we need to do a better job than we've done this far. Well, I think we're gonna have to call it there due to the time. Uh, I just wanna give one final thanks to our panelists. I think that was a fantastic discussion and really appreciate you guys joining us today. So we have, we have one more panel, uh, which is the transportation working group panel, and uh, we'll give about 
five, ten minutes to stretch your legs and uh, get those panelists up here and uh, settled in. So thank you all very much.
All right, folks, we're going to get started in about two minutes with the next panel, so two-minute warning. All right, if everyone could make their way to their seats, please.
folks, if folks could make their way to their seats, please. All right, thank you everyone. And uh, we are on to our last panel of the day, which is the Transportation Working Group. Uh, so I'm gonna start off this panel, um, just give everyone an opportunity uh, to introduce themselves and their background and who they work for, and then we'll uh, move forward to the next part. So Joyce, you wanna start? Is this, can you guys hear me? Yeah, okay. I'm Joyce Taylor, I'm the Chief Engineer of Maine DOT, and I've been the co-chair of the Climate Council's Transportation Working Group. I'm uh, Jason Rao, I'm at Central Maine Power, I'm the Energy Environment and Regulatory Policy Manager there. Um, I am involved in the climate, uh, uh, climate Working Group there at the Climate Council, also on a lot of other uh, working groups that Dan went through, um, and uh, yeah, looking forward to this discussion. Thanks, hi everyone. Um, my name's Rob Wood, I'm the Director of Government Relations and Climate Policy for the Nature Conservancy in Maine, um, and I uh, co-chair the uh, Transportation uh, Working Group of the Climate Council with uh, Joyce. Look forward to, uh, to the, the discussion today. Great, well thank you guys, and I really appreciate you taking the times out of your very busy schedules to join us today. Uh, so how this panel is gonna work, with they, uh, each of them have put together a PowerPoint presentation and have brief presentations that they're gonna move through, uh, and then we'll open it up to question and answers to to close it out. So I'm gonna now turn it over to, uh, to Joyce to give her presentation. Thanks, Ben. Um, to start with, I would say, you know, it's interesting because when the Climate Council was being put together and everyone was talking about transportation emissions being 54% of the issue and what was DOT going to do, and the commissioner and I were saying, we don't tell people what cars to buy. <laughs> kind of wondering what our role is in this whole thing. Um, so I, I do think that one thing I want to leave you with, or maybe start you with, is the Department of Transportation's job is to be there during an emergency. You know, when CMP went out in the windstorm, DOT cleared the roads so their trucks could get there. Um, our job is to make sure that during a crisis, emergency services can get somewhere. So adaptation, resilience, climate is a big deal for us. Um, we have changed our design standards for bridges and culverts to go bigger. Um, we really believe that, you know, we don't want to be where Vermont was with Tropical Storm Irene, where they had literally a whole county and, and whole towns that were unreachable for days, if not weeks, in a couple cases. Um, so that was a lesson learned, I think, for us, is that we need to know that we can get people um, to help those people who don't have power, those people who don't have services. And I find it interesting when people talk about climate and whether they believe in it or not. Um, every state DOT has to write a transportation asset management plan for federal highway. I dare say, to my knowledge, all 50 states have named climate as a threat. Um, it is a threat to infrastructure. It may be in Arizona, sandstorms are your thing, um, compared to water here in the, the Northeast, but we're all seeing things that are impacting the system and that affect you know, mobility and safety. So I would just start with that as to why we have such a strong interest in this topic. Um, there is some money coming, and we've all heard about the American Rescue Plan Act, and so there is some money for broadband in there, as well as um, the DOT has been asked um, to work with, um, well, has been asked to distribute $8 million for charging. Um, our plan right now is most likely to work with Efficiency Maine um, and use the existing programs. That makes a lot of sense to us. And we'll be looking for charging opportunities with our transit agencies when they're ready. Um, I'm going to come back on my next slide to the $5 million for workforce um, transportation pilot projects. That, that program does not really um, connect with climate, but we're trying to have some synergy with climate efforts because it really is a ride-sharing program to get people to work, in particular in rural areas. So we have some ideas, and we could frankly use some help um, from the chamber on this. Um, and then there's $20 million to start an adaptation and climate resilient local infrastructure program. Um, so there is going to be money available. Uh, we've been talking to DEP and DHHS. DOT is going to be administering this grant program. And what we're trying to do is um, find, you know, what, what makes sense, what's ready, what's ready. DEP has been working with some of the wastewater plant operators on climate plans, so they may have some things ready to go. 
um, but we want to be able to spend that money and not let it sit on good projects. Um, so we're, we're looking at what that's going to look like. And then we've got a couple bills in play in, fed, in the federal government, and um, we anxiously await to see what happens. I see my friend from Senator Collins' office. Um, so we are anxious. <laughs> I think what we are hearing is there's a t lot of enthusiasm for transit and passenger freight rail um, and EV charging and what that's going to look like and rebates um, and incentives. A lot of money for electric buses. Um, we keep trying to say it's great to buy them, but it would be nice to operate and maintain them. Um, and to have some money for that would be wonderful. And we have some other issues. So let's see if I can do this right. Am I pointing that way? Whoops. Did it work? Yeah. OK. So electric vehicles are really going to be what it takes to meet the, the climate um, goal. And it's interesting because about 94% of people in Maine commute to work in their private vehicle. So the vast, uh, the, really the vast majority of opportunity there is to reduce greenhouse gases with, is personal choice, right? It's, it's having people in an electric vehicle. Um, that said, I can tell you about 94% of my time is spent talking about transit and active transportation. Everyone is really, really enthused about those for, for good reasons, but um, one of the things that we've been working on is um, an, ele um, an electric, uh, actually let me go back, is a strategic plan for transit because what I keep saying is we can buy all the electric buses in the world, but if nobody wants to ride them, what difference have we really made? And so we have to change driver behavior. And probably a lot of that is going to be um, you're not going to see the big buses that you would see in the cities. I think there's going to be something that everyone's kind of buzzword right now is microtransit. You're going to have smaller coaches or vans, and they're going to come to your house or close to your house, get you to where you want to go. Um, we've been looking at um, there's different kinds of trip planners out there that other states are further ahead where you can, you know, if you're te tech savvy, you can get online and get your trip. And, you know, if you're within a couple hours, um, of where you need to go. Maybe you can schedule it that day if you're four or five hours away. Maybe you give 24 hours notice. So we're looking at all of that in the plan and we're looking at what makes sense. Um, and we're trying, we are also working, uh, which I'm excited about, with the Department of Labor, um, DHHS, and DECD because we said, you know, it makes no sense to have a transit program, again, that nobody rides, and is there a way for us to cut through some of the, the stuff that's keeping people from being able to share rides? If you're Medicaid, Medicare, you can't share a ride. Does that make sense anymore? And so we're, a lot of states are really kind of trying to push this right now to say, um, we should be able to put you know, somebody who needs to go to school, you know, a college kid, we should be able to put someone who's in recovery on that bus, we should be able to get people to a hospital, a doctor's appointment, and we should be able to get them to work. They should all be able to ride together. Doesn't that make a lot of sense? So um, it's like solving world peace sometimes, I think, but we are trying to work on that issue and trying to work with the transit agencies and others, and especially our sister agencies, who are excited about it, which is, which is really helpful. We've been participating um, with Hannah Pingree's office on a clean transportation roadmap and really been looking at that and what that's going to look like and, and what are the policies, the rules, the laws that may, might be stopping us from being able to do some of the things we want to do in the transportation world. So that will be done at the end of the year. And we've been working, DOT's been working with Efficiency Maine, um, and we came up with really a gap analysis for level three chargers, which are the fast chargers. You know, I think Rob would tell you, or we'll tell you about the TNC focus group. But a lot of people, um, I know we, we had electric vehicles available at the state, and I was going, hey, who wants to ride an electric vehicle? And a lot of my, if you've ridden in one, it's really a blast, actually. And we have one, and a lot of people have tried it out, and they like it. But the first thing they say is, well, I have to go to Machias, or I go to Aroostook County. Where can I fast charge? I don't want to do a, a slow charge. So I don't think we're really going to be able to push electrification in people's minds until we get more of those 
uh, fast chargers out there. So that's really going to be the first thing that we try to accomplish with um, with the $8 million. And we're going to have to think strategically about how do we make this work so that people are willing um, to ha host these sites. So another thing that, that's not on my list, but when it comes to electric vehicles, there's been a lot of conversation about equity. Um, these cars are expensive. And so how do we, you know, we have a lot of um, rural Mainers who um, don't make as much money um, as others who are driving some of our least efficient, oldest cars in the fleet. So how do we get people into electric vehicles or into a hybrid? We had the University of Maine do a project for us. Um, Commissioner Van Note wanted to bring it to the Climate Council. And it really kind of talks about, is there room for two or three or four years while we get the used EV market going to incentivize people to get a higher efficient vehicle um, and so that you still are saving greenhouse gases. So that's something that we've been encouraging. Um, we're encouraging it in the roadmap. Um, not everyone likes that idea, but I think it has merit. And so we've continued to push that there should be opportunity because um, you're still, you know, you get someone in a 15 mile per gallon car and you get them up to 32, it's a significant difference. Um, we are doing um, a transit bus electrification plan. There's really, um, so much enthusiasm for electric buses out there. We um, did some research with some of the other transit agencies, and we think there's still some work to be done on the electric buses, but we also think there's some work to do in-house. Um, it's not like you go and take a bus and you know put it into your outside <laughs> plug. So you know, almost all of the transit agencies are participating, and we're going to be asking what I would call not high level but medium level questions. Um, where's your power source? What kind of power do you need? How big does your building need to be? Um, what would the routes be? How many extra drivers would you need? Could you do smaller buses? Um, you know, what what do you want to do for routes in the future? So that when this is done. Hopefully some of this money that's coming from the federal government, they'll be able to actually do some implementation work with it. And by then I think the buses, you know, the bus companies are certainly learning. They're making a lot of changes. Um, they've seemed to be real partners in, in trying to get to a success. So, um, but I think this plan will help us. So one of the other goals of the transportation and peace was to reduce vehicle miles traveled. And of course we were in the middle of the pandemic and. Um, miles driven way down, uh, they're pretty much back to normal right now. So, and it's interesting because I don't know about you all, but when I'm on a Zoom meeting or a Teams meeting and I count the number of people that are still home, it's still like the majority that are home. So I'm like, who's driving? Where are people driving? Because <laughs> it's still this, almost the same amount of miles. So we have some work to do. We, um, we are um, going to be on lead with the Go Main program for ride sharing. Um, the Turnpike will be continuing to work with us on that. And we really are planning to kind of relaunch it in January. We wanted to get through the brunt of the COVID before we started asking people to ride share. But we would really like to have 10 or so companies that might want to partner with us to help launch the Go Main program. We, you know, we're still talking about, you know, you know, there might be some money in the federal bill to rent electric vehicles and do something, um, you know, to have those available. So, you know, it's all talk right now. We're all just throwing ideas around, but the Go Main program will be kicking off in, in January, and I think it's going to be a good program. It's going to come with an app now and a ride planning um, tool, so it's going to be a lot easier to use, especially if you do have technology. Um, you can still call and find out about it, but mostly you're going to rely on this app. I think, it's, I think it is going to um, help you understand how to get from point A to point B. Um, so I did talk about the strategic transit plan, um, and I talked about this workforce transportation program. So one thing that, um, again, with the chamber that I just want to put out there is we're in the middle of figuring out how to just get the money out from the five million in the ARP program. And we're going to have a discretionary pot of money, and if a company wants to hit us up with a proposal on ride sharing um, in terms of getting people to work and picking people up, I mean, we're going to be open-minded, you know, if you're a wreath-making company, the starch company, and there's this, you know, and your folks can't get to work because they don't have a license or a reliable car, 
um, maybe we purchase vans and you run the operating cost and take that on. I mean, that's that's something that you know we're looking at. We're going to look for proposals. We're currently having conversations with BIW, um, Maine Health, and, and Portsmouth Naval Shipyard too to talk about can they take advantage of this program and get people to work. So, trying to work on that. Um, a lot of um, we're rewriting the complete streets policy. There's a lot of folks um, in the bike pedestrian world who really want to see more from the department and the state in terms of being safe. I mean, really it's the chicken and egg thing. Um, I think more people would walk if they felt safe. I think more people would ride their bike if they felt safe, <clears throat> and they don't. So what can we do to help encourage that? Getting people to bike and, and walk doesn't necessarily do a, a lot in terms of meeting the climate goal because the, the numbers aren't there in terms of greenhouse gas reduction, but it has a lot of synergy with other efforts and um, we think that it is part of the climate piece and it's an equity piece as well. Um, we've been looking um, at an e-bike program, some, uh, Vermont's doing something with um, helping people get back to work with e-bikes and so there's a number of states that have been doing that, um, trying to to get people the, a reliable ride most of the year. So we've been working on that. And then just, you know, the reality is when, I don't have to tell many of you here this, but when you start talking about getting people back to work, it comes down to reliable transportation, childcare, and affordable housing, right? So, you know, and then you throw the climate piece in there. So what we are trying to do is acknowledge it's, you know, no one sector is going to solve all the problems here, but can we try to make transportation more green as we try to get people to where they need to go? And at the end of the day, um, equity here in Maine probably means people get to be able to get to where they want to go um, in, in a reliable manner and in a manner that doesn't take all day if it's a, you know, an hour trip. So um, that's what I have, and I will pass the baton, and um, I think, you know, I can talk some more about medium and heavy vehicles. Matt, if Matt was here, he would, but right now, the goals around um, the Climate Council are really around light-duty vehicles. Excellent. Thank Thanks, you. Joyce. Um, and I just want to say, first of all, it's, I'm continually ex excited to hear about all the, the great work that's happening at Maine DOT. And, uh, across state agencies um, in support of the Climate Action Plan, so thank you. Um, so I'll uh, just share um, a little bit about the Nature Conservancy's uh, work on uh, tr uh, transportation and climate issues uh, in Maine briefly to, to start, um, so you understand the perspective we're bringing, and then I thought I would share um, some uh, findings from research that uh, we commissioned uh, earlier this year. I know a few folks here in the room have probably already seen uh, the, the results from these focus groups, but um, for those who haven't, I think it's an interesting kind of um, you know, foundation for discussion about um, tra clean transportation and, and rural communities and, and things like how do we build out um, the necessary uh, EV charging infrastructure. So um, just briefly, uh, for the Nature Conservancy in Maine, you know, the ways that we're supporting the Climate Action Plan and, and uh, uh, transportation and climate uh, issues uh, in Maine uh, really falls into two buckets. Um, first, we're working on infrastructure resilience, and so that takes the form of both uh, kind of uh, bringing our own philanthropic resources to and advocating for um, state and federal uh, funding for um, infrastructure res resilience projects. That's both both um, on the coast and inland. Um, that often takes the form of looking at helping uh, municipalities uh, do culvert replacements. And the reason why we're focused on culvert replacements is, is twofold. Um, first of all, uh, those uh, undersized culverts can be uh, a road safety and, and climate resilience uh, uh, issue. And so um, upsizing a, a culvert um, can lead to uh, better climate resilience. And then also there's the co-benefit of improving aquatic habitat connectivity and, and fish passage. And so there's kind of um, a, a dual purpose uh, there. And so we're doing that on the coast and inland. And then uh, we also uh, develop decision support tools uh, for municipalities and, and other audiences. Um, so a couple of years ago, um, in collaboration with a number of partners and university researchers, uh, we published a, um, the, a, a decision support tool that we call the Coastal Risk Explorer. Um, and so this is a, a tool that allows municipalities to really dig deeply into not just um, what uh, their community will look like under different sea level rise scenarios, but also um, which kind of parts of the community are most socially vulnerable to those impacts. And so, you know, where, where might a road be 
um, you know, cut off from emergency services, for example, leaving a, a community um, in, a, in a tough situation. Um, and so we're, you know, actively working with municipalities to get uh, those that that type of decision support tool into their hands and help them um, with with climate resilience planning. So that's resilience on the clean transportation um, and, and greenhouse gas mit mitigation side. Um, we're very focused on on policy development and advocacy. Um, so you know, supporting, for example, the development of the, the climate action plan through the transportation working group, um, and also very um, you know interested in in the clean transportation roadmap and supportive of the clean transportation roadmap uh, process. We are also uh, looking for ways to support um, one facet of the, the climate action plan in particular, um, which is uh, uh, supporting medium and heavy duty um, electric vehicle pilot projects. And so I, I think maybe earlier the, uh, the Mount Desert Island High School electric school bus was, was referenced, uh, but that, uh, that has been on the ground um, at MDI High School uh, for a couple of months now, and the Nature Conservancy in partnership with the Climate to Thrive and, and the high school and Vermont Energy Investment Corporation uh, supporting an evaluation and case study of the um, MDI electric, uh, MDI high school electric school bus um, that we hope will help kind of smooth um, the way for additional school districts that are looking to, to uh, uh, you know, per perhaps purchase or lease an electric school bus in the future. And we're looking for other ways to support uh, pilot projects as well. Um, and then the, the last uh, kind of bucket um, that I'll mention that we'll segue into to, uh, this, this slide deck is that we're, you know, we're really trying to dig in and understand uh, the key barriers to clean transportation and specifically electric vehicles in rural communities and opportunities to overcome uh, those barriers. Uh, and so we did some uh, public opinion polling in 2020 and then we did uh, some in-depth discussion groups um, earlier this year uh, in March of 2021. Um, with a firm called uh, Newbridge Strategy, um, whom we work with um, often on, on these types of uh, uh, issues and that really I feel like has a good kind of handle on understanding um, the particular challenges and opportunities in rural communities. Um, so we talked to um, 23 uh, uh, rural drivers in Maine, New Hampshire, and Vermont over a three-day period. Um, none of these rural drivers um, have an EV currently, and we wanted to understand, you know, what do they see as the biggest challenges uh, to, to um, you know, potentially owning an EV in the future and what's kind of, what would be standing in the way and then what are some, you know, ways that, uh, or what are, what are some opportunities to kind of bring down those, those barriers. Um, we got a lot of great information. I'd be happy to share the, the full results um, with, with you, but I, I have a few just what I think are the most interesting uh, takeaways here from, from that research. Remind me, Ben, is it, did I, did I get it? All right. Is it the green? The green, the green okay, great. Um, so you know, for, first and foremost, you know, cost, the upfront cost does, does certainly matter a lot. That is a barrier, uh, but it's not the top barrier. And so this, this might seem like common sense, but you know, this was corroborated in our research. Um, you know, the, the, uh, really, it comes down to a lifestyle fit. Will this EV kind of meet the needs that I have as, as a rural driver? Um, can it do all the same things that my internal combustion vehicle can do? That, that seems to be kind of the, the number one um, issue kind of at, at the top of mind um, for these, these rural drivers that we um, talk to. And, oh, it's the bigger one. There we go, got it. Um, and, you know, more to the point, um, the reliability of the vehicle uh, and its ability to, to get where you need it to go from point A to point B. Um, again, not, not rocket science here, but um, we confirmed that range anxiety is real. Um, concerns about purchasing an EV are, are most directly tied to uh, you know, getting stuck if your battery runs out. And um, you know, we especially saw a, a pretty significant safety component um, coming through uh, in, in the discussion group. So uh, you know, folks feeling like it would be um, not just inconvenient, but potentially dangerous um, to, to uh, you know, run out of a charge. Um, we also asked about home charging and at work charging, you know, those, those two areas in particular. Um, we found that there wasn't a lot of uh, kind of uh, knowledge or understanding about what it takes to charge at home um, and, and what types of opportunities there are to charge at work. And so a big opportunity there for um, kind of education. Um, we, we asked about, you know, so we put forward some potential benefits to driving an EV and, and asked again, what do folks think are um, the top potential benefits of driving an EV? Um, and again, we saw kind of similar to that, that first slide, 
um, that uh, you know, the, the ability of an EV to do all the same things that my, uh, my current vehicle does, that is the top potential benefit. Um, Long-term savings, cost comparability, um, low maintenance costs and requirements, those are all important, but also a little bit less important than convenience and the ability of the vehicle to do what I needed to do. Um, then we, we, provide, we started providing some information um, to discussion group participants um, to see how they reacted to different forms of information. Um, we showed videos of electric pickup trucks, for example. Um, and I think no surprise, um, folks were excited about the electric F-150, first and foremost. They're excited about other um, electric pickup trucks also. So I think, again, when you see that um, you know, an electric vehicle can be a lot like the vehicle that I might currently drive, um, that, that elicits a, a very positive um, reaction. We, did, we provided some facts about um, wintertime driving, so you know, both th things like positive facts like um, you know, handling in the snow is usually quite good for electric vehicles because they have a lower center of gravity, um, and also um, you know, the, you'll, you'll have the same you know, heating capability as, as your, um, your, your car that you have right now, except also providing some, some facts on the other side of the coin, including you know, lo lower battery range uh, in cold climates, for example, and got a mixed reaction from those mixed bag of facts, probably unsurprisingly. We did ask um, about uh, snowplow capability, and interestingly, that was not rated. You know, a couple of folks thought that was interesting, um, you know, and important uh, to have, you know, the ability to attach a snowplow to the front of the, you know, F1 electric F-150, for example. But it wasn't really top of mind for folks. Um, Similarly, we put forward um, annual cost savings uh, estimates for folks. We actually asked um, for uh, participants in states where there is a cost calculator available. We asked folks to uh, go to the cost calculator for their state and actually calculate out what their annual cost savings would be from driving an EV. Um, some significant cost savings on an annual basis from driving an EV, and it was rated as uh, something important, but also um, I think not as resonant as we might have expected it to be um, because there is still that upfront cost barrier from the EV. And so it's great that there are um, you know, uh, um, annual cost savings from driving an EV, but what do I do about that, that upfront cost? We also shared some testimonials from EV drivers in Maine. Um, these were helpful. Folks like to hear from uh, you know, folks they know, um, their friends and family and neighbors about the benefits of driving an EV. Um, there was still some skepticism. You know, there's one one video with an EV that was, you know, a, a very small, an older, smaller model, and that was seen as less um, kind of persuasive than uh, the other video where there was a newer uh, model that that kind of was much more similar to, um, a, you know, standard internal combustion vehicle. And then. Um, Last piece of information we put forward um, where, where I thought this was actually quite really interesting. Um, we asked about the fact that uh, GM, you know, GM had just made the announcement that they're you know, looking to go all electric, I think by 2035, um, and you know, lots of announcements being made by um, you know, vehicle auto manufacturers. Um, and that elicited, we thought it would elicit mostly a positive response. It was kind of a mixed bag, so there were a lot of folks who said, yeah, that's, that's actually really good. Um, that we're heading in that direction, but then there were also those who said, um, well, I, that means there are gonna be fewer choices for me down the road. And so there was a little bit of a, a, a mixed bag in terms of response. So for me, the most encouraging, um, I think, part of this discussion group when we think about opportunities is that you know, we asked about, um, you know, now that folks had, getting, had gotten into um, the, you know, under, gotten to a, a better level of understanding about where EVs are currently, we asked, you know, what, what might, um, you know, government do to support um, the transition to, to electric vehicles for rural communities? And across the board, there was um, support for the government playing a role in EV charging infrastructure. And so this was, um, you know, we had, again, 23 participants um, from across the political spectrum, different, you know, diversity of, of ages and, and genders. And there was um, quite a bit of, of enthusiasm for the idea that, um, you know, we, uh, we see a big gap in charging infrastructure and there's a role um, for, you know, something other than the private sector uh, to, to, to play um, to bring more EV charging infrastructure online. Um, and then also, you know, there's a desire for it not to cost anything, uh, but I don't know if that's realistic in, in, the, in the long run. You know, you see some municipalities that offer free charging or some business owners that offer free charging currently, but that was certainly um, something that was uh, attractive as well. But I thought, you know, the um, uh, the role that folks saw for uh, government in EV charging was, uh, was, was quite interesting. 
And then the other area where folks saw a big role for government is in um, education. And I hope, Michael's not here, but I hope that Efficiency Maine doesn't mind me um, showing just a screenshot from the um, you know, new educational video series that Efficiency Maine put out um, uh, that is, or that, it, that they are currently rolling out featuring Tim Sample, um, which if folks haven't, if you haven't seen it yet, it's really, uh, really good. Um, and uh, I think that will, um, you know, hopefully uh, be a, a, big, a big step forward in terms of um, kind of bringing facts uh, to the public in a, in a digestible way um, about the future of electric vehicles and things like how do you charge at home, for example. Um, lastly, I just wanted to share that, you know, we did at the beginning of the discussion group um, ask, you know, whether uh, these individuals are, are um, likely to purchase an EV as their next vehicle or not at all likely. The beginning of the discussion group before we had provided any kind of facts about electric vehicles or potential benefits of electric vehicles, um, slightly fewer than half um, were saying that they would consider an EV for their next uh, vehicle. By the end of the dis discussion group, dis you know, we provided positive and negative facts, uh, I think an objective kind of view of electric vehicles. We did get about um, two thirds of folks saying that they would now consider an EV for their next vehicle. Um, so again, rural, rural drivers and, and rural northern New England. So I thought that was overall um, a pretty encouraging sign. I think that's it. Um, the last thing I'll mention before kicking it over to Jason uh, is just that, um, you know, TNC does a lot of our work in, in rural communities, and um, we actually have quite a few uh, uh, company vehicles and, and pickup trucks uh, that we use to, um, you know, take out on our on our land for our stewardship team, for example. Um, and for that reason, we've recently developed a partnership with Rivian, um, and Rivian is providing some of their early. Um, I think it's the R, R, RT1 or R1T, I can never keep it straight, some of their early new pickup truck models um, for TNC preserves in different parts of the country. Um, and we're also partnering with Rivian to um, install EV charging infrastructure on certain preserves. And so we'll hopefully have a couple of preserves in Maine um, that have uh, Rivian charging infrastructure before too much longer. I'll uh, stop there and pass it over to you, Jason. through in this presentation uh, what we're doing at CMP and Auburn Grid uh, around our electrification strategy, our plans, and our current efforts and our pilot projects. So just as a general overview to start, uh, you know, at Auburn Grid, you know, CMP is part of Auburn Grid, and, oh, you know, our, our purpose, we say our purpose as a company is to work together to develop more accessible clean energy model that promotes healthier more sustainable communities every day. So part of that strategy um, includes an ESG plus F strategy. So you've probably heard of ESG investing. Um, so we really espouse this environment plus social plus government uh, type of approach to social, uh, socially responsible investing plus maintaining a strong fiscal position. As part of those efforts, you know, we, we do espouse uh, principles of sustainability. We publish an uh, annual sustainability report, which uh, there's a cover from our latest one from this last year on the upper left. And um, also with regard to sustainability, we as a company, as part of the, actually the Global eBadrola group, group um, uh, follow the uh, UN Sustainability Development Goals as part of our core business strategy. So, you know, it's interesting that Hannah Pingree this morning mentioned COPs. Uh, 26 in Scotland, so actually a sister utility to Avon Grid is Scottish Power, which is helping to host that um, uh, summit. So very proud of that. Be participating as you know Ibadrola, uh, to support those efforts. Um, so so we you know so in here we we have a main focus in the UN Sustainability Goals on Goal 7 and 13 around uh, clean energy and and climate action. So. Driving now, drilling down into uh, uh, electrification of transportation, we have developed uh, an EV strategy um, across Auburn Grid, and this we break it into sort of uh, into five categories. Uh, you know, we, we're looking to be leaders, uh, to be partnership, <laughs> to 
to, to help our communities in which we operate to be leaders um, in uh, electrification of transportation. So in breaking that down, we, we, we really look at it as EV supply equipment is one category. So this is uh, the delivery infrastructure. So how are we getting those electrons to those vehicles? This gets at make ready program. So how can we um, um, get that charging infrastructure, incentivize that charging infrastructure to get it more built out? Another pillar is EV readiness. So what are we doing to uh, integrate uh, this increase in EV load, which is will, will be coming into the system? Are we ready for that EV load? You know, where is the load going to be? You know, what are our forecasts and what are we doing with forecasting capabilities to understand that oncoming EV load? So that is another focus. Uh, EV load integration, so this load is coming, but how are we actually integrating that load onto the system in an efficient manner? So this gets at such things as rate design, um, uh, technological solutions to such as managed charging solutions, um, you know, ways that we can integrate this load in, in an efficient manner so we don't uh, just drive up more costs on, on the system and have to build more infrastructure. But we will we'll probably need more infrastructure. We will need more infrastructure, but let's utilize the system that we have as efficiently as we can. Uh, fifth, a fourth pillar, communication and marketing. So again, customer engagement. We need to raise awareness with our customers around EVs. And finally, what are we doing internal to our own company to lead by example for company use and our employees. Uh, so, you know, we do have a goal at Avant Grid to um, convert 30% of our fleet uh, by 2025 and 60% by 2030 to um, clean, clean fuel alternatives. So around uh, EV forecasting, this is a wordy slide, but this gets at the complexities of trying to understand how EV load may impact the system. And these are some of the questions that we ask on the top and some of the activities that were actions we're taking uh, on the bottom to, to address the question. So, you know, EV load is dynamic um, and, uh, you know, the charging patterns uh, and the load shapes of integrating that load may be changing over time. So, for instance, 10 years ago, first generation EVs had maybe had 100 miles range, right? So, if you were to drive from here down to Portland, you'd got to need a destination charger. Well, now, fast forward 10 years, you might have a 250-mile range, right? So you don't need a destination charge. You can get home and back. So that's a dynam dynamism that's happening with the change of just the EV, EV car technology itself. Um, and that's, you know, so how is that going to evolve in the future around, you know, what are the frequencies, times, and durations of when people will charge? Um, what rates will they want to charge? Is it level two, uh, level three fast chargers? Um, a big concern is fleets. So a fleet is a big spot load on the system, which could have system uh, impacts on the network. So what are we doing to understand which fleets are going to electrify when in the terms of the, in the medium, especially in the medium heavy duty space. So we're looking at, um, you know, we have a partnership with EV Connect to get charging pattern data. We're analyzing our meter data for different charging types. We have developed circuit level focused, uh, more granular EV load forecast at the circuit level. Um, we've developed a fleet inventory, again, to understand uh, fleet uh, what fleet electrification may occur. Um, we're using traffic volume data. Um, actually, as part, there's a, we have a research partnership with MIT to do some modeling of expected EV charging loads. And, and, and further, and it goes on, and we continue to try to find more ways which we can uh, try to understand how EV load is going to in impact the system. So around EV uh, infrastructure, uh, we have, uh, and actually uh, load integration, we have, so those two of the other pillars, we have two uh, pilot projects which we uh, launched uh, last year in 2020 which are actually an outgrowth of uh, legislation from 2019. So we work together with stakeholders um, to pass the beneficial electrification bill um, in 2019, which had the commission go out for an RFP for uh, uh, EV pilot projects. And so we submitted two, and one pilot is on a make ready program. This is actually, pro these programs um, are existing across the US, uh, 
but the idea here is that we uh, um, essentially, if you look up here at this little graphic, you know, normally when you have a new charging station interconnect, it's the it's the customer's responsibility to pay for any incremental costs to interconnect. A make ready program has utility cover um, investment capex, not just um, way up here, but what would normally be the cost of the interconnecting customer um, is, is covered by the utility down, um, you know, down here near the meter and even behind the meter. Not ownership of the charging station, but up to the pedestal. Uh, so we, our pilot, we have uh, 60 plugs that we um, were authorized. We had proposed a, a much larger program, but what was authorized was 60 level two ports. And um, we actually, happy to say, we have, and I'll show you some pictures, but this is fully subscribed. We have a lot of, we had a lot of interest and uh, oversubscribed. So we now we have p many on the wait list who are interested in participating to get more charging stations built in the state but um, we don't have any authorization yet to uh, continue this program. We also have a pilot project around, um, uh, so yeah, so we have 58 applicants, so including 22 public entities. We also have around, uh, load, uh, around EV integration, uh, around rate design, you know, one of the challenges with uh, fast charging stations is, uh, are the OPEX costs. So um, can can be a challenge if you have a new charging station that's a fast charging station, so you're having a lot of electricity at one time, causes a lot of demand on the system, so you need big pipes, right? And that, um, <laughs> that, that can result in significant demand charges, which the level three station can't turn around, and when they resale the electricity, they don't have enough utilization because there's not enough usage yet at that station to, to raise enough revenues to turn around and cover those delivery costs. So, um, that's a challenge that's seen across the industry. You read about that in the policy literature. And so we're piloting a two-part demand rate design to uh, try to alleviate that. Um, it gives actually a little bit more accurate price signal, so it's a sustainable type of rate design from an economic efficiency and, and, and rate design um, theory point of view. But uh, what we have seen um, so far is that we've seen a over 40% reduction in the demand cost for these participating stations. So. Um, it's encouraging early results at this point. So just uh, some pictures. This, this is from our L2 Make Ready pilot. So we did get uh, Wells Library participated. And here's our, one of our EV bolts uh, plugged in there. And uh, we also have the Falmouth PD has procured an, uh, uh, a Mustang Mach-E police cruiser. And so this is the cruiser without, it's not yet decked out, and uh, it's, but there's, a, there's the charger, so. And then finally, you know, again, getting to our own company uh, commitments, you know, we, we are committed to, you know, on the light duty side, you know, 100% uh, light duty uh, clean fleet by 2030. So there's another one of our EVs, and that's my son at my uncle-in-law's land out to Whitefield there, but, um, yep. It's, uh, that's it, so happy to take questions, have a good discussion here with the other panels. Has anyone seen the Mustang? It is wicked <laughs> Yeah. One of my coworkers just bought it. I'm not a car person, I thought it was cool. <laughs> Did you, Ben, do you want us? Did you have your hand up, Marty? No. Thank you very much for the um, very informative. Uh, Steve Perry with Sajin Corporation. Uh, I had two questions. Rob, um, we've been in the landfill business for about 40 years now, and um, has there been any thought about the cycle life of the batteries and what we're going to do with them when they're exhausted? And the other part is, uh, uh, Jason, uh, I live out in a rural area, and it's around a, a lake where 1960, there were seasonal camps, so basically the, the power is run to service these camps, so all of a sudden now these camps are year-round homes with hot tubs, and now we're about ready to introduce them to EVs. What type of infrastructure plans do we have to uh, get this up, and who pays for the bill for that upgrade? Sure, happy to, happy to start. Great question. Um, thank you for that. And 
you know, I, I know that there's a, a lot of innovation happening um, around, um, you know, re uh, recycling uh, uh, batteries. Um, I, I can't speak to, you know, exactly where where we are uh, in, in that, that process. Um, but I do think that there's there's hope, you know, in the future that there will be um, ways to recycle uh, EV uh, batteries, as well as more sustainable ways of, you know, um, uh, building the batteries in the first place, right? So the, you know, the batteries have, you know, there's some concerns around around the, um, you know, rare earth minerals that, that go into batteries, and you know, there's a lot of innovation happening in the private sector um, to to reduce, uh, you know, aimed at reducing the the need to extract those minerals in the first place to to build batteries. So hopefully. You know they'll they'll become more sustainable on the front end, um, and there will be opportunities for recycling um, at the end of the useful life. Yeah, and to the infrastructure question, you know it's a good question, and that's and that's why we you know do look at the um, EV load forecasts and are disaggregating at the circuit level, so we're combining um, that the circuit level information with some demographic information. In the near term, we are not too concerned with um, the level of light duty EV uh, integration onto the grid, I, you know, that's actually is dispersed. So, um, you know, certainly there might be certain rural circuits that might need um, some upgrading, but it's, um, it, what is a little bit more of a concern are those big spot loads I mentioned. So if you have like a fleet, if you have a fleet uh, company decides, um, US Postal Service decides to con convert everything to an EV, um, all of a sudden you have a lot of EVs that are, and so we need to understand those plans and, um, and then who pays, I mean, that's, that's incremental load, right? So uh, load growth is, is, just goes into rates for everyone. And so that gets to, you know, how are we um, providing the cor correct price signals or are we doing managed charging programs or other programs where we can uh, again, integrate that load in an efficient way so that even though there may be costs, we're not, we're, we're, we're using the system that we have as efficiently as possible. Okay, so um, um, one of the things you haven't mentioned is that from what I've heard, there are 10 times as many EVs in Quebec which is to our north and colder than we are. What, what have you gained from um, talking to your Quebec colli uh, colleagues about winter driving and charging and so on? I think there, there have been conversations. Um, Marty is here and um, E2 Techs um, hosted something with our Canadian partners that was really interesting. And, you know, we are learning, and I think, you know, if you look at it, the cars of today have a lot more range, and people learn how to drive them with the range. And, and most people here in Maine, for example, commute 30 miles a day. So they're well within the range. I think, um, I just saw some statistics, I'm trying to think where I saw it, I think it was part of the roadmap, looking at the percentage of charge that gets lost in the winter. And, you know, people have always said it's 50%. Well, it's not that anymore in the newer cars. Um, in terms of transmission, I would leave that to Jason. Yeah, I mean, I, I will just add with the cold weather performance, you know, at CMP, we did have another pilot project back in 2013, 14, 15 timeframe where we did look at the, the battery performance, part of that pilot was looking at battery performance of the EVs in different temperature ranges. So we had trackers that we put on certain EVs that we, subs, that we provided incentives for, for, for folks to, to, to purchase. And, you know, you definitely did see a cold weather penalty. I think that has improved somewhat today. And Joyce is right, like there's a longer range, so you can, still, you can absorb more of that cold weather penalty. And I know that in the industry, the manufacturer, you know, the, the, the car manufacturers are certainly looking at um, that cold weather penalty and trying to uh, pioneer new approaches. I've, I've heard that maybe solid state batteries may, may help solve that problem somewhat. It, so it's an issue, but I think as long as you go in with your eyes open and you understand what that uh, degradation might be in a cold weather, um, you know, you, you can, um, and you have a longer range, you, you can still. Um, get to where you need to go and, and get back. I just read an article that some of the manufacturers are looking at the heating systems that have a big draw on the electric 
um, charge and looking at heating differently. So, I mean, they're, they're doing all kinds of things to make this more convenient for people. I, I think, Joyce, you may have said, answered this question when, in, when your presentation, but if you did, I didn't hear it, I'm sorry. But I think uh, the electric car, the electric vehicle, uh, it's all obviously it's grown in popularity. There's a waiting list now for them for the next couple of years out. Um, but when, you when it comes to the employer community, I know that a lot of employer communities are already putting stations in. I think it's probably happening, obviously, more in the population base in Southern Maine than it is Northern Maine, which we heard earlier in an earlier presentation. We're going to need we're going to need a lot more of that because the miles these people have to travel is is incredible. But the point is, and this is what you may have answered, Joyce, and I apologize. But if you if we really want people to get on the on the road with these vehicles. I think the charging stations are a huge incentive at, at home, where they can charge them up all the way at home. They can a fast charge, not the regular charge. But wouldn't we be wouldn't it behoove us to put more focus on that, on getting incentives, much like Efficiency Maine does with, with their incentives for uh, energy use? Wouldn't it be wouldn't it behoove us to do that instead of maybe focusing more heavily? It seems like we're doing now on businesses and and uh, and public entities to to put them in. It just I mean, it just yeah. seems like that might be a better use of our yeah, money. Yeah, I, I don't know if Michael Stoddard showed you the gap analysis map that we've worked on, but it really heads up to Aroostook County, Washington County, um, Franklin County, Somerset, and one of the things he and I have been talking about is you know our RFP for those are going to probably look a little bit different because we need to have an incentive um, for folks who are probably not going to get a lot of charging um, and that we need to figure out how, how we can um, have people want to install those. And so, you know, we've had some conversations about what does an incentive look like. But I agree with you. I think, you know, why would necessarily um, somebody in Machias, Maine want one of these at their gas station if maybe a couple times a week it's going to be used or three or four times. So I think we, we are putting thought into that and that's really the first thing we want to do with the ARP money is really get at that equity issue and spread them around rural Maine in a way that um, it makes sense. And I'll just add too, like, I, this reminds me of a uh, presentation I saw from Flo at a drive electric main meeting years ago, but even the Flo as a, as a, as a charging station, uh, I think one of the largest uh, installers in, in, in Canada, and I think they're also deploying a network in New York City. But they, what was interesting is that they're in the industry, they're installing these fast charging stations and trying to understand um, who you know, which stations are going to be utilized more than others, um, you know, which, which goes to the, you know, the, the, the viability and the economic sustainability of these stations. Even they didn't really know at that, you know, at time. So the industry is, itself is still learning. So they, you know, they were surprised to see that actually the, the fast charging station that was utilized the most was um, the one that was not in, a, in actually a, a gap in terms of like long haul transit, but actually um, uh, stations that were installed in sort of uh, metropolitan areas where there's multifamily housing, so there's you know less access to um, you know that you don't have you know a single family home for home charging. So these le level three charging stations that were in those areas were utilized more. So yeah, so it's it's complex and evolving. So Joyce, I'm going to follow up on a question I asked Hannah earlier this morning, but I'm not going to tell you what she said. I'll let you. <laughs> um, and it's the same question that I raised and we've been talking about here. You know, the, there is the big concern that once we get north of Augusta, there's just not that much there. And I'm con I mean, there's a lot of Maine north of Augusta. And if we're even looking at putting in, you know, 30 or 40 stations, that's but a drop in the bucket of what we're going to need. And you know, I'm an EV owner, but, and I've been lucky, knock on wood, 
today was sort of the first day after a year of ownership that, oh my goodness, there's a backup at the charger. And, you know, right now we're all, all of us EV people, you know, we're in a rare minority, so there's always a charger. If the charger's there, you can always pull up. But if it's one of these level two chargers and it's somebody else's charging, you're kind of out of luck. And the same thing with the, the fast DC level three chargers. We, we call them fast chargers, and yes, they are much faster than level two, but it's still two to three times longer than stopping to fill up your car with gas. Mm -hmm. So I think in, until we can increase and, or decrease the amount of time it takes to, to charge and really find a different way to, to get these all over the place so the range anxiety, uh, people can you know, not be as anxious about it. I think those are the two, two key things. I, I'm, I'm very worried about um, soon I'm gonna be making my trips and I know exactly where the chargers are and I get there you know, and I know I need to be in, in a certain place in three and a half hours and I plan an extra half hour to charge along the way and then all of a sudden I get there and it's blocked and I've got, I gotta wait for them for 30 minutes to, to charge and then I've got 30 minutes to charge. That, that seems like an untenable solution. So did Hannah complain about the time there were two people in front of her? <laughs> so, you know, so. Yes, this morning, it was Marty and me. <laughs> so to that point, what we've been talking about is four different phases um, that we've been talking with Efficiency Maine on. And the first really is that kind of more rural gap analysis. But we also need to look at where are people increase, you know, where are they using them? Do we need more um, plugs? Do we need to add plugs? What, that's the next step. Where are more plugs going to happen? We need to look at the areas um, where there are apartment houses and people don't have garages. So there is sort of this plan of action that we're trying to look at that very thing because it's, you're right, it's, it's going to just turn people off if they, you know, yeah, you take 10 or 15 minutes to charge, but if you wait for two other people in front of you, um, it's interesting, we put a level two charger in at DOT, and I mean, no one, not many people are at the office. And the other day I went out and there were four EVs out there in a row and I went, oh my God, we need another charger because people aren't even in the office yet and I got four people. So it was, it was kind of a wake up call for us that we're probably going to have more folks using it than we thought even two years ago. But I, it's evolving and I think, you know, the best we can do is just chase the data and the numbers and, and do our best um, to plan. And I think it looks like, you know, we're going to have some additional money in the infrastructure bill for charging that we'll be able to utilize. Hi, Barry Sheff from Woodard and Curran, and thank you very much for all of your remarks. Uh, this is a great day, by the way, and so thank you all for putting it on. Um, I come to this as an engineer. I'm a new EV driver um, and proud tree hugger. And I, I heard the commissioner of the DOT, and sorry, Joyce, I'm going to ask the question of you, um, once say that uh, his job was to manage a deteriorating um, transportation network and transportation infrastructure with declining resources. Um, this plan calls for 200,000 EVs by 2030. We seemingly kicked the can down the road around the gas tax and have continued at the legislature to not address that. And I'm curious what conversations are happening, how we're going to bridge that gap. I haven't stopped at a gas station for six months, and I probably won't again. Yeah, um, I just love that man. He's <laughs> um, no, I mean the tr the reality is today I've got two major bridge issues going on, and looking at you know some postings, and you know we close bridges, and and we do have a declining system. We don't have the money to take care of it. That is the reality. And frankly, EVs need safe roads and bridges too, right? You don't want to go over the bridge that I'm going to close for an internal combustion engine vehicle. So, you know, I think right now there aren't enough EVs that the whole gas tax thing is really worth the fight. And there really has to be a national model. You know, at, at, when you talk about vehicle miles traveled and measuring, you know, we've been doing some pilots with, I forgot what they're called now, but it was the old I-95 coalition. It's really easy to sort of game the system if you're crossing state lines, and they discovered that in the Delaware, Maryland area. 
So I think we, you know, this is going to have to be a national solution. I don't think states can do it alone. Um, all we can do at DOT is continue to be truthful. I mean, the reality is a lot of money in the infrastructure plan is not for traditional transportation infrastructure. It is what it is. But I can tell you we have a plan to close bridges. So we're actively working on some of those, and it's not easy. But, you know, if I can look at a bridge from here to there, I'm not sure we need to. And that's a really hard community conversation to have. They don't go well when you take something away. Um, you know, we, we are struggling, and prices are up, right? Workforce is a problem. Materials are a problem right now. So we're, we're in this weird place where there's this kind of unbridled enthusiasm to a certain extent of things that you're seeing in the infrastructure bill. And then we're like Debbie Downer over here about you know the roads and the bridges. Um, it's not lost on us. So we have two more questions, one here and then I'll come over to you. Thanks, hi, Kim Mondonado, Mendel Financial. I am learning to be a tree hugger. Uh, and I don't, I don't speak all of the language that you're using. But help me to understand something. I'm puzzled. I, I, I love that we're working on uh, getting EVs and that the Maine is going to be infused with monies from the uh, federal uh, government. However, right now, the way that EVs, when we're talking about, it seems like when we're, you're, the panel, panelists are talking about electronic vehicles and, and a lot of other uh, new technologies, that, that it's a... Um, oh, kind of a paintbrush of there's going to be fewer emissions. But is it not true that the electricity that is uh, fueling the vehicles is currently created by uh, coal, gas? I, I don't know. I mean, I, I'm guessing it is. So is there, are, are, at least initially, are we really polluting less or not hurting? You know, we're better on the climate by doing this? Or what's... It, isn't it kind of like, uh, I don't know, e equal equilibrium right now? Or Anyway, can you add some help uh, on that? Thanks. Happy to, yeah. happy to start on that. Or, yeah, go. Okay. Yeah, no, that's a, it's a great question. Um, so I'd say kind of a two-pronged answer. Um, you know, you're right that, that right now as we're transitioning to, to more clean energy on the grid, um, that, you know, plugging in your EV and, and, and refueling your EV right now, um, is not you know producing zero emissions. However, depending on you know wh where you're doing so, you're going to most likely be um, you know uh, producing less emissions than you would be by by burning gasoline. So that it, it depends on on you know which which regional grid you're a part of. In Ice and New England, we have a uh, you know relatively um, clean grid relative to some other regions. And so you know here when you're plugging in, you're you're getting um, you know pretty substantial climate benefit. But I think you know we obviously have to be moving toward uh, much higher levels of, of clean energy, um, solar and wind, et cetera. Um, and so um, once we, you know, as, as we're bringing more um, uh, solar and wind online and bringing more EVs online, you know, hopefully over time we're getting to a point where we're achieving those goals of, of beneficial electrification. That's where the, uh, a buzz phrase that you used earlier, Jason, you know, just essentially, um, you know, uh, fueling uh, transportation and heating with clean electricity uh, is kind of the, the name of the game right now. Yeah, and I'll just add, I mean, I know this morning, I think it was Steve Hudson from the IECG had a slide uh, illustrating how um, from 1990 till today that the, you know, it's actually the um, uh, industrial sector has achieved the highest reduction in emissions. Um, that was like over like 58%. Like but the electric sector um, in New England was at 50%. So, you know, from 1990 till today, we have... We, and transportation is actually negative, so they, you know there's actually more emissions. So there's been no, no progress in the transportation sector, but in the electric supply sector, we have been able to reduce emissions fairly significantly over the past uh, 30 years. So, you know, as Rob's saying, I think the the, the intent is that uh, that'll continue, um, and it's now it's you know on the margin in the ice in New England market, it's natural gas often setting the price. And so, you know, you, you're comparing, um, uh, you know, gasoline versus natural gas in terms of carbon emissions. Of course, there's some losses and uh, conversion losses when you're going from natural gas to making electricity and transporting it. But um, I think the expectation is that um, as we have these renewable energy targets, and, you know, in Maine's very aggressive, Hannah Pengree pointed out this morning, very aggressive renewable portfolio standard, 
uh, by 2030. By the time we get to scale with EV deployment, we'll have a fairly, you know, uh, clean grid that's required for, for that electricity supply. And I would just add, don't underestimate how um, well the electric vehicles work with all this autonomous technology and cars. So the manufacturers are really driven towards this because they really like the cool bells and whistles that come with the autonomous vehicles. So it's ha happening not just for climate reasons, in my opinion. Uh, my name is Allison Arbo, and I represent Destination Moosehead Lake and Moosehead Lake Region um, Economic Development Corporation. And I'm hearing, um, as we're talking about this, one of the things that's not being brought up is tourism. I come from a place, um, a county, where we have residents who are at a very high level, um, are on the high level of, you know, the poverty scale. Um, so the residents of the county aren't going to be, you know, probably the first in line to purchase these EVs. But our people who are coming to visit and our second homeowners, their summer homeowners, are going to be having these vehicles. How are these communities going to be able to get the access to these chargers? I mean, right now I can think there's one charger in the town of Greenville. Right. And um, what is going to be the incentives for these towns to get them where they see that their residents aren't going to be the ones using them, but we will have a large population of people in certain months needing these, and we don't want to cut off these visitors from coming to the state who supply our economy the greatest. You'll be happy to know that Greenville's actually on the list for phase one, and that is something that we consider as the tourism industry. Um, it's important to Maine. It's worth a lot of money. And you might, I don't know if Michael showed a map, but interesting, Green, Greenville's this little blip where you're seeing EVs, so some of your folks from away probably have them. Um, they're living there year round and they're registered in Maine. But yeah, I think the RFPs have been open to the communities um, to apply, and that's still a model we'd like to have. Um, you know, we have libraries who host them, we have different towns that host them, and they can be a destination. So I think that is an important point. And you know, places like here, you know, Scott, right, Scott, you have yours. I mean, they were an early adopter, and I think a lot of the, you know, the hotels, bed and breakfasts are gonna see that as a draw. Great. Well, thank you, everyone. And I just want to give a uh, round of applause to our transportation working group panel. And uh, just to close out the event today, I just want to, again, thank everyone for coming. I know it was an uh, incredibly long day, but I appreciate uh, everyone who attended. I think all panels were incredibly informative and gave everyone a great overview of what the state is doing and also what the business community in Maine is doing to adapt to uh, the climate action plan. I want to give thanks to a couple other people. First, our tech guys in the back who helped us with the logistics of all the event today. And then Angie Arno, who's our events director at the chamber. She, she's the one who did all the real work for this <laughs> event. And uh, we will have a cash bar and some hors d'oeuvres in the back. So please uh, hang around and have a drink and uh, snack with us. Thank you, everyone.